Hello and welcome to all of you out there wherever you are in the world. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director and creator of the Shakespeare deck and this is The Show Must Go Online, performing a Shakespeare play every week in the order they were believed to have been written. Thanks so much for joining us again this week if you're returning and welcome if this is your first time. Tonight's Henry VI Part 3 will commence in approximately 15 minutes time. The first half will run for approximately 90 minutes. There will then be a 10 minute interval followed by the second half which will run at approximately one hour. Tonight's game, if you want to play along, is Spot the Betrayals and there's plenty of them. Uh, trigger warnings for this evening's show include loud noises, violence, gore and war crimes including against children. Special thanks, as always, to our growing team, whose details can be found in the video description. While you're there, please feel free to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and consider donating to our Patreon, an opt-in hardship fund for all those who take part. If you want to play along at home tonight, our game... Oh, no, I've done our game already, that's great. <laughs> on social, you can tag me at Rob Miles on Twitter, or follow The Show Must Go Online on Insta and Facebook. Share your reactions using the hashtag show must go online. At this time, I'd like to introduce our cast and crew, starting as always with our incredible producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm an innovation project manager and actor from Glasgow. And introducing our new associate stage manager, Emily Ingram. Hi, I'm, uh, hi, I'm Emily. I'm a professional theatre maker, director and writer from Edinburgh. And returning on Foley, it's Richard Hand. Hello, I'm Richard Han from the University of East Anglia. And joining us again via the miracle of satellite technology are resident flight directors Yarrick Dor and Enrique Ortuño. At this point, it's a great pleasure to welcome our cast for tonight's production, all of whom have given their time and talent freely to entertain tonight in Henry VI Part 3. This cast has been put together by the fantastic Sidney Aldridge casting director, playing the Earl of Warwick, Ali Croker. Hi, I'm Ali Croker. I'm a professional actress from Hertfordshire, where some of these battles take place. Playing King Edward IV, Lisa Hill Corley. Hi, I'm Lisa Hill Corley, a Washington DC based actor and writer. Richard of Gloucester, Ashley Byam. Hello, I'm Ashley Byam. Uh, I'm a professional actor and I live in London. Henry VI, David Johnson. Uh, hello there, I'm David Johnson. I'm an actor and the co-artistic director of Exeter-based theatre company, Sun and Boon Theatre. As Queen Margaret, Ramona von Push. Hello, I'm Ramona. I'm an Australian-German actress based in London. Richard of York, Lee Kravitz. Sorry, Lee Ravitz. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Lee. I am a character actor and I'm based in Africa. As Lord Clifford, Ruth Page. Yeah, I'm Ruth Page and I'm a professional actor from Nottingham. George of Clarence, Lois Abdul Malik. Hi there, I'm Lois Abdul Malik. I'm a professional actor director in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Lady Grey, Emily Beach. Hello, I'm Emily Beach. I'm a professional actor and presenter and I'm based in Hampshire currently. As King Louis XI and Somerset, Alexis Danen. Hello, bonsoir. I'm Alexis Danen, actor, French actor based in London. As Edward, Prince of Wales, Hector Bateman Harden. Hello, my name is Hector Bateman Harden, and I'm a professional actor and schoolboy, and I'm in Surrey. As Earl of Oxford, Yoki Yu. Hi, this is Yuki. Ni hao, I'm from China. I'm in Spain right now, finishing my uh, studies in acting. As Northumberland and Lord Hastings, Carol Harvey. Hi, I'm Carol. I'm a professional actor and I'm based in London. As Montague, Lucas Bracherfrons. Hi, I'm Lucas. I am a director and dramaturg based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. As the Earl of Rutland and Henry Earl of Richmond, Scarlett Archer. Hi, I'm Scarlett Archer. I'm a young actress and I'm from Sheffield. And introducing our fantastic ensemble for tonight, first of all, Mehmet Ozbek. Hi, my name is Mehmet Ozbek. I'm a professional actor and academic from Turkey. Christopher Smart. Hi, I'm Christopher Smart. I'm an actor, musician and theatre maker from the Midlands. Lindsay Hubner. Hi, uh, I'm Lindsay Hubner. I'm a Canadian actor based in London. Bernard Soubry. Hello, bonsoir. I'm Bernard Souvry, a climate scientist in Montreal, Quebec. Russell Proctor. 
Hello, I'm Russell Proctor. I'm coming to you all the way from Australia. I'm an actor, writer and teacher. Julia Giolzetti. Hi, I'm Julia Giolzetti. I'm a swing and I'm based in San Diego, California. I'm Clay Sanderson. Hi, I'm Clay Sanderson and I'm a professional actor and all around theater person based in Phoenix, Arizona. Wonderful, thank you so much. So Julia and Clay are our valiant swings for this evening in the event of technical difficulties or personal emergencies, they will bravely step in to keep the play running along smoothly. And now to introduce the play, I'm delighted to welcome our special guest for this week, Owen Horsley. Owen's directing credits include multiple shows with the RSC, as well as shows at the Classic Stage Company, the Watermill and Shanghai Dramatic Arts Centre. Owen was associate director on the RSC King and country tour and work with artistic director Gregory Doran on Richard II, Henry IV Part 1 and 2, and Henry V from 2013 to 2016. Owen has also been an associate director for Declan Donnellan's Cheek by Jowl since 2010. Owen created Bard City in 2016, which offers Shakespeare training in New York and London, as well as presenting innovative versions of his plays. So far, they have produced multiple Shakespeare in a Week workshops, including Antony and Cleopatra, Macbeth and Troilus and Cressida, and created new interpretations of Hamlet and Twelfth Night. Owen, we're delighted to have you on the show. The play is Henry VI Part Three, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very, very much, um, Rob. And also thank you, Sarah. This is really exciting to be part of this. Um, and it's been amazing the past couple of weeks to be able to watch and listen to um, these great plays, these plays that are very close to my heart right now. And um, the imagination that's been put into these have just been amazing. I've been thinking a lot about this new medium of um, Zoom and how we are sharing work through Zoom. And um, I've been thinking a lot about how it's affected our quality of listening, and especially when it comes to sharing theatre, and especially when it comes to um, looking at Shakespeare. Uh, I want to talk about that a little bit later, but I thought I'd just kind of get us right into the play, part three, um, the final chapter. Um, the epic saga comes to an end. Uh, we kind of start pretty much exactly where we left off um, after St Albans and a victorious York. They come straight to London and York ascends the throne. Um, Henry then comes in with his followers and a whole battle, a war of words takes place in the Parliament House, uh, overwhelming our King Henry, which you've got to know very well by this point. And he makes a, an offer. That offer is that if, Hen if York allows Henry to remain as king until he dies in York and then his heirs can take the throne afterwards. Um, of course, this doesn't go down very well with Henry's followers and they are particularly angry at this king, uh, none more so than Margaret who vows to start an army uh, against the Yorks. Meanwhile, in York, um, York's three sons are also not very happy with this, uh, trying to persuade their father to take the crown now uh, and not wait and uh, disregard this oath that uh, has been offered by Henry. Uh, just as that happens, Margaret turns up um, with her army and they uh, are victorious against uh, the Yorks in the next battle. Um, Yorks being unprepared, uh, they lose the battle to um, the Lancaster uh, faction. This very early on in the play uh, gives birth to one of my favourite scenes in the play, which is between York and Margaret. From then, we are catapulted into a flurry of battles. This play has the most battles in all of Shakespeare. Um, so I'm very excited to see how you're going to do all these battles. Um, and it really is a back and forth. Uh, game. I'm not going to go into the details because you're about to see this play and you'll be able to see it for yourself. Um, but you know, one minute Edward is king, um, then Henry is king, then Edward again, um, and Edward gets maybe a little bit too cocky and then something starts to happen, betrayal happens in his camp and then Henry and then he gets captured. It really is something that goes back and forth in the most thrilling and um, exciting way. Uh, and what's I think possibly the most thrilling part of uh, part three is the emergence and the birth of um, Richard, 
so what we hear, what we see in this play and what we hear in this play is um, Richard III, who we know very well from his, uh, his own play, uh, we get the opportunity to see how this character grows, how this character interacts with his brothers, how he interacts with um, his, his father as well, which is a very interesting relationship to see in this play. So there we are in terms of the play that we're looking at tonight. And one of the things I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit, because uh, it's a personal fascination of mine, is, is language. Talking about the quality of listening in Shakespeare's plays, but really important to think about the language of these plays and how over the course of these three epic plays, Shakespeare takes us on a real journey of language. Uh, it's an almighty tool language in Shakespeare's play, in theatre in general, but really in Shakespeare. Um, each character in Shakespeare uses language to um, express thoughts, feelings, um, trying to articulate a truth, and also especially in this play because it's so active to affect change and especially to win. Um, words are used to charm, to persuade, to manipulate, um, and also words fail. And I think that's really interesting when we're thinking about this play because um, when words fail, violence prevails, and there is a lot of violence in this play. But how do we get here? How do we get to the language of part three? And I just want to go back slightly to think about the journey of language through the three plays very quickly. Uh, in part one of you would have heard two weeks ago, um, there's a heroic, chivalric um, a hangover from the world of Henry V, seen through the character of Talbot. Um, and that language journey very quickly shifts into something that is much more political. If we think back to that wonderful scene in the temple garden with the roses, um, the language of suggestion, the language of um, politics is really fascinating when it comes into um, the, how it changes part one. Uh, in part two, that suggestive language really continues. And also we see that the uh, theme of ambition coming in, which is a fascinating theme of part two. Um, and manipulative language is very, very key in part two. It's a, a, the birth of manipulation through language. Um, and also how language is used against people, in particular Gloucester and Henry. Um, and then there's something that happens at the end of part two, which really propels us into part three. And that is the use of plain language a plainness, a directness, a deliberate use of language. Um, I think that is given birth by the amazing character of Cade, and I don't think it ever lets up. Um, and I think possibly in the most sinister way at the end of part two, which leads us into part three, uh, part three is um, young Clifford at the end of part two, when he finds a, his father dead, he very plainly connects himself to um, uh, the fact that he will, um, in cruelty will he find his, his fame um, and no longer have anything to do with pity. And that's a real shift in the play, the directness, deliberate, brutal directness of language, which we see going into part three um, and this theme of revenge, which really propels us forward into part three into something that is quite barbaric, um, um, fun, but also quite scary at times in terms of what Shakespeare does with the language and how brutal um, it is. Um, another really interesting thing in this um, in this play and the use of language, and it's a good little thing to listen out to. I know you have your fun little game about uh, spotting the betrayals, but I'd also love to propose another little game, which is to um, really listen out for the repetition. Uh, the repetition is really key in part three. I think it does something wonderful in terms of the back and forth of this play. The language really mirrors that. Um, listen out particularly in part in, in the first scene. Um, so much repetition about crown, about taking the crown, about the throne. Um, it's really fascinating just to tune your ear into that kind of language. Um, it's relentless. And I think that's a part of the language quality of this play that it's relentless and there's no going back. Um, it's also seen in other parts of the play. Um, Henry VI, who I think, you know, is one of the most gorgeous characters in the world. Um, his repetition in the famous um, speech on the molehill, uh, so many hours, so many hours, so many hours, so many hours, repeating it four times in that sense of despair is, um, it's really quite beautiful and poignant in this play through the sense of Richard. And really, I think what's um, my favorite repetition in the play, which ends um, the kind of language journey 
is this play is Richard's repetition of the personal pronoun I in his final speech. Um, it's something to really listen out to, but it's where the play ends, the idea of the self, the idea of power at any cost, the idea, to, idea of loyalty only to yourself. Um, this idea of Henry's final line when he talks about, oh God, forgive my sins and pardon thee. It feels like that line is a foreign language to where we've got to at the end of this play. Um, it's a thrilling thing to, um, to be part of and to, to, to really think about the language um, that Shakespeare uses in these plays. It's kind of a bombastic play, it's thrilling. Um, it's kind of almost Shakespeare at his most um, Tarantino-esque. Um, and I love that, I love that about this play. And I hope that you really kind of have a chance to listen out to some of the things that um, we've been talking about because I think in this medium, it's doing something rather wonderful to the way that we hear things. And I think Shakespeare's plays are the best things that we've ever heard. Um, so anyway, I'll leave you with that. And I hope you really, really enjoy this production because I know I will. And uh, thank you so much, Rob and Sarah as well, for the opportunity to introduce this play. Thank you. Good start. Thank you so much, Owen. That was absolutely fabulous. Really, really appreciate you taking the time. And I learned a lot there as well. So I'm sure our audience have too. Definitely look out for those uh, wonderful ideas there with the game as well. Looking forward to that, uh, playing along with that myself. So uh, at this point, it will be wonderful uh, to uh, invite you all to see Henry VI, part three. Act one, scene one. London, the Parliament House. Enter Richard Plantagenet, the Duke of York, Edward, Richard, Norfolk, Montague, Warwick, with drum and soldiers. I wonder how the king escaped our hands. While we pursued, the horsemen of the north, he slowly stole away and left his men without the great lord of Northumberland. Lord Clifford and Lord Stafford, all abreast, charged on the battlefront, and breaking in were by the swords of common soldiers slain. Lord Stafford's father, Duke of Buckingham, is either slain or wounded dangerous. I cleft his beaver with a downright blow. This is true, father. Behold his blood. And here's the Earl of Wiltshire's blood, whom I encountered as the battles joined. Speak thou for me, and tell me what I did. Oh, Richard, hath best deserved of all my soul. Thus do I hope to shake King Henry's head. <laughs> and so do I, victorious Prince of York. This is the palace of the fearful king, and this the regal seat. Possess it, York, for this is thine, and not King Henry's heirs. Assist me then, sweet Warwick, and I will. And when the king comes, offer him no violence unless he seek to thrust you out perforce. I'll plant Plantagenet, root him up who dares. Resolve thee, Richard, claim the English crown. My lords, look where the sturdy rebel sits. Even in the chair of state, he slew thy father and thine, Lord Clifford, and you both have our revenge on him, his sons, his favourites, and his friends. If I be not, heavens be revenged on me. Shall we suffer this? Let's pluck him down. Speak patience, gentle Earl of Westmoreland. Patience is for poltroons such as he. He does not sit there had your father lived. My gracious Lord, here in the Parliament, let us assail the family of York. Well hast thou spoken, cousin, be it so. Ah, know you not the city favours them, and they have troops of soldiers at their beck. But when the duke is slain, they will quickly fly. Far be the thought of this from Henry's heart, to make a shambles of the Parliament House. Cousin of Exeter, frowns, words, and threats shall be the war that Henry means to use. Thou factious Duke of York, descend my throne, and kneel for grace and mercy at my feet. I am thy sovereign. I am thine. For shame, come down, he made the Duke of York. It was my inheritance, says the olden one. 
Thy father was a traitor to the crown. Exeter, thou art a traitor to the crown in following this usurping Henry. Whom should he follow but his natural king? True, Clifford, that's Richard, Duke of York. And shall I stand and house it in my throne? It must and shall be so. Content thyself. What title hast thou, traitor to the crown? Thy father was, as thou art, Duke of York, thy grandfather, Roger Mortimer, Earl of March. I am the son of Henry V. Henry IV, by conquest, got the crown. It was by rebellion against his king. Richard, in the view of many lords, resigned the crown to Henry IV, whose heir my father was, and I am his. He rose against him, being his sovereign, and made him to retain his crown before. Suppose, my lords, he did it unconstrained. Think you to a prejudicial to his crown? No, for he could not so resign his crown, but that the next heir should succeed and reign. Art thou against us, Duke of Exeter? Yes, it's the right, and therefore pardon me. Why well, whisper you, my lords, and answer no? My conscience tells me he is a lawful king. All will revolt from me and turn to him. Plantagenet, for all the claim thou layest, think not that Henry shall be so deposed. Deposed he shall be in despite of all. King Henry, be thy title right or wrong, Lord Clifford vows to fight in thy defence. Oh, Clifford, how thy words revive my heart. Henry of Lancaster, resign thy crown. What mutter you or what conspire you, lords? Do right unto this princely Duke of York, or I will fill the house with armed men, and over the chair of state, where now he sits, write up his title with usurping blood. My lord of Warwick, hear but one word. Let me for this my lifetime reign as king. Confirm the crown to me and to mine heirs. And thou shalt reign in quiet whilst thou live. I am content. Richard Plantagenet, enjoy the kingdom after my decease. What wrong is this unto the prince, your son? What good is this to England and himself? Come, cousin, let us tell the queen these news. Farewell, faint-hearted and degenerate king, in whose cold blood no spark of honour bides. Be thou a prey unto the house of York, and die in bands for this unmanly deed. In dreadful war mayst thou be overcome, or live in peace, abandoned and despised. Turn this way, Henry, and regard them not. They seek revenge, and therefore will not yield. Ah, uh, Exeter. Why should you sigh, my lord? Not for myself, Lord Warwick, but my son, whom I unnaturally shall disinherit. But be it as it may, I hear in tale the crown to thee and to thine heirs forever, conditionally, that here thou take an oath to cease this civil war, and whilst I live, to honour me as thy king and sovereign, and neither by treason nor hostility to seek to put me down and reign thyself. This oath I willingly take and will perform. Long live King Henry, Plantagenet, embrace him. And long live thou, and these, thy forward sons. Now York and Lancaster are reconciled. Accused be he that seeks to make them foes. Farewell, my gracious lord. Oh, here comes the queen, whose looks bewray her anger, and I'll steal away. Exeter, so will I. Nay, go not from me, I will follow thee. Be patient, gentle queen, and I will stay. How can I be patient in such extremes? Ah, wretched man, would I have died a maid and never seen thee, never born thee, son, seeing thou hast proved so unnatural a father? Father, you cannot disinherit me. If you be king, why should not I succeed? Pardon me, Margaret, pardon me, sweet son. The Earl of Warwick and the Duke enforced me. Enforced thee? Art thou king and wilt be forced? I shame to hear thee speak, oh, timorous wretch. Warwick is Chancellor and the Lord of Cullis. Stern Falcon Bridge commands the narrow seas. The Duke is made protector of the realm, and yet shalt thou be safe. Such safety finds the trembling lamb environ it with wolves. Had I been there, which am a silly woman, the soldiers should have tossed me on their pikes before I would have granted to that act. But thou preferst thy life before thine honor. 
And seeing thou dost, I here divorce myself from thy table, Henry, and thy bed. The northern laws that have forsworn thy colors will follow mine, and once they see them spread, and spread they shall be for thy foul disgrace and the utter ruin of the house of York. Thus do I leave thee. Come, son, let's away. Our army is ready. Come, we'll find up to them. Stay, gentle Margaret, and hear me speak. Thou hast spoke too much already. Get thee gone. Gentle son Edward, thou wilt stay with me. Die to be murdered by his enemies. When I return with victory from the field, I'll see your grace. Till then, I'll follow her. Come, son, away. We may not linger thus. Exeunt. <laughs> One, scene two, Yorkshire, a room in Sandal Castle. Enter Richard, Edward, and Montague. Brother, though I be youngest, give me leave. No, I can better play the orator. But I have reasons strong and forcible. I how now, brothers, son, at a strife. What is your quarrel? How began it first? No quarrel, but a slight contention. About what? About that which concerns your grace and us. The crown of England, father, which is yours? My boys, not till King Henry be dead. Your right depends not on his life or death. Now you are heir, therefore enjoy it now. I took an oath that he should quietly reign. But for a kingdom, any oath may be broken. I would break a thousand oaths to reign one year. No. God forbid your grace should be forsworn. I shall be if I claim by open war. I'll prove the contrary, if you'll hear me speak. That's not, son. It is impossible. A an oath is of no moment being mm. not took before a true and lawful magistrate that hath authority over him that swears. Henry had none, but did usurp the place. Then, seeing t'was he that made you depose, your oath, my lord, is vain and frivolous. Therefore to arms! And, father, do but think how sweet a thing it is to wear a crown. Why do we linger thus? I cannot rest until the white rose that wear I be dyed in even in the lukewarm blood of Henry's heart. Richard, you know, I will be king or die. But say, what news? Why comes thou in such post? The queen, with all the northern earls and lords, intend here to besiege you in your castle. She is hard by with 20,000 men, and therefore fortify your hold, my lord. Aye, with my soul. What? Think thou that we fear them? Edward and Richard, you shall stay with me. My brother Montague shall post to London. Let noble Warwick, Cobham, and the rest, whom we have left protectors of the king with powerful policy, strengthen themselves. And trust not simple Henry and his own. Brother, I go, I'll win them, fear it not. And thus most humbly do I take my leave. Sir John and Sir Hugh Mortimer, mine uncles, you are come to Sandal in a happy hour. The army of the Queen means to besiege us. She shall not need. We'll meet her in the field. What, with five thousand men? Aye, with five hundred, father, for in need. A woman's general? <laughs> what should we fear? Mm. <laughs> I hear their drums. Let's set our men in order and issue forth and bid them battle straight. Five men to twenty, though the odds be great. I don't not, uncle, of our victory. Exeunt. Act one, scene three. Field of battle between Sandal Castle and Wakefield. Enter Rutland and Tutor. Shall I fly to escape their hands? Sweet Clifford, hear me speak before I die. I am too mean a subject for thy wrath. Be thou revenged on men and let me live. In vain thou speak'st, poor boy. My father's blood hath stopped the passage where thy words should enter. Then let my father's blood open it again. He is a man, and Clifford cope with him. But I thy brethren here, 
their lives and thine were not revenge sufficient for me. The sight of any of the House of York is as a fury to torment my soul until I root out their accursed line and leave not one alive. I live in hell. Therefore... Oh, let me, let me pray before I take my death. To thee I pray, sweet Clifford, pity me. Such pity as my rapier's point affords. I never did thee harm. Why wilt thou slay me? Thy father hath. But twas ere I was born, thou hast one son. For his sake pity me, lest in revenge thereof, since God is just, he be as miserably slain as I. Ugh, let me live all my days in prison, and when I give occasion of offence, then let me die. For now thou hast no cause. No cause! Thy father slew my father, therefore <laughs> Plantagenet, I come, Plantagenet, and this thy son's blood cleaving to my blade shall rust upon my weapon, till thy blood congealed with this do make me wipe off both. Exit. Act 1, Scene 4, another part of the field of battle between Sandal Castle and Wakefield. Richard, New York. The army of the Queen have got the field. My uncles both are slain in rescuing me and all my followers to the eager foe turn back and fly like ships before the wind. Oh, hark! The fatal followers do pursue when I am faint and cannot fly their fury. And were I strong, I would not shun their fury. The sins are numbered that make up my life. Here must I stay, and here my life must end. Come, bloody Clifford, rough Northumberland, I dare your quenchless fury to my rage. I am your boat, and I abide your shot. Yield to our mercy, proud Plantagenet. Aye, to such mercy as his ruthless arm with downright payment showed unto my father. Now Phaeton hath tumbled from his car and made an evening at the noontide prick. My ashes as the phoenix may bring forth a bird that will revenge upon you all. I will not bandy with thee word for word, but buckler with thee blows twice two for one. Hold, valiant Clifford. For a thousand causes, I would prolong a while the traitor's life. What wrath makes him deaf. Speak thou, Northumberland. Hold, Clifford. Do not honour him so much to prick thy finger, though to wound his heart. <clears throat> what would your grace have done unto him now? Brave warriors, Clifford and Northumberland, come, make him stand here upon this molehill here, that wrought at mountains with outstretched arms, yet parted by the shadow with his hand. <coughs> what was it that you would be England's king? Was it you that reveled in our parliament and made preachment of your high descent? Where are your mess of sons to back you now? The wanton Edward and the lusty George. And where's that valiant crookback prodigy, Dicky, your boy, that with his grumbling voice was wont to cheer his dad in mutinies? Or with the rest, where is your darling Rutland? <laughs> Look, York, I stained this napkin with the blood that valiant Clifford with the rapier's point made issue from the bosom of the boy. And if thine eyes can water for his death, I give thee this to dry mm. thy cheeks with all. Mm. Oh, alas, poor York, but that I hate thee deadly, I would lament thy miserable state. I pray thee grieve to make me merry, York. What? Hath thy fiery heart so parched thine entrails that not a tear can fall for Rutland's death? Why art thou patient, man? Thou shouldst be mad, and I, to make thee mad, do mock thee thus. Stamp, rave, and fret, that I may sing and dance. Thou wouldst be feed, I see, to make me sport. 
York cannot speak unless he wear a crown, a crown for York, and lords bow low to him. Hold you his hands whilst I do set it on. <clears throat> Aye, marry, sir, now looks he like a king. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, <laughs> this is he that took King Henry's chair, and this is he was his adopted heir. But how is it that great Plantagenet is crowned so soon and broke his solemn oath? As I bethink me, you should not be king till our Henry had shook hands with death. And will you pale your head in Henry's glory and rob his temples of the diadem? Now, in his life, against your holy oath. Oh, tis a fault too, too unpardonable. Off with the crown, and with his crown his head, and whilst we breathe, take time to do him dead. That is my office, for my father's sake. <laughs> Pray, stay. Let's hear the orisons he makes. She will be frank, but worse than wolves of France, whose tongue more poisons than the others too. Receiving, it is in thy sex to triumph like an Amazonian troll upon their woes whom fortune captivate. Needs not, nor it boots thee not, proud queen, unless the adage must be verified that beggars mounted from their horses to death. What is opposite? To every good as the antipodes are upon us, all tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. How couldst thou bring the lifeblood of the child to bid the father wipe his eyes with all, and yet be seen to wear a woman's face? Is thou me rage? I know thy ass, thy wig. Of me weak. Will I know that I ask my will for raging winds blow up incessant showers and when the rage are laid, the rain begin these tears and my sweet Rutland subsequies and every drop cries vengeance boys death against thee fell Clifford and thee falls French woman, the face of his, the hungry cannibals would not have touched, would not have stained with blood, but you are more than human, more inexorable, oh, ten times more than tigers of Hyrcania, sea ruthless queen, a hapless father's dear, this club. Thou dipst in blood of my sweet boy, and I with tears to wash the blood away there take the crown. With the crown, my curse, in thy knee. Such comfort come to thee as now I reap at thy too cruel hand. Ah, oh, Darty Clifford, take me from the world. My soul to heaven, my blood upon your head. Had he been slaughterman to all my kin, I should not for my life but weep with him to see how inly sorrow gripes his soul. What, why a weeping right, my lord Northumberland? Think but upon the wrong he did us all, and that will quickly dry thy melting tears. Here's for my oath, here's for my father's death. <laughs> Oh, and here's to write our gentle king. <clears throat> oh, open thy gates of mercy, gracious God. <clears throat> My soul lies through these wounds to seek out thee. Off with his head and set it on your gates. So York may overlook the town of York. <laughs> Exeunt. Act two, scene one. A plain near Mortimer's Cross. Enter Edward, Richard and their power.
wonder how our princely father escaped, or whether he escaped away or no from Clifford and Northumberland's pursuit. I, I cannot joy until I be resolved where our right valiant father is become. See how the morning opes her golden gates and takes her farewell of the glorious sun. As of mine eyes, do I see but three suns? Three glorious suns, each one a perfect sun. See, see, they join, embrace, and seem to kiss, as if they vowed some league inviolable. Now are they but one lamp, one light, one sun. In this the heaven figures some event. Tis wondrous strange, the like yet never heard of. I think it sights us, brother, to the field, that we, the sons of brave Plantagenet, each one already blazing by our meads, should notwithstand join our lights together and overshine the earth as in this world. But what art thou, who heavy looks foretells some dreadful story hanging on thy tongue? Ah, one that was a woeful looker on, when as the noble Duke of York was slain, your princely father and my loving lord. Oh, speak no more, for I have heard too much. Say how he died, for I will hear it all. Environed he was with many foes. By many hands your father was subdued, but only slaughtered by the ireful arm of unrelenting Clifford and the Queen. They took his head, and on the gates of York they set the same, and there it doth remain, the saddest spectacle that e'er I viewed. Oh, sweet Duke of York, our prop to lean upon. Now thou art gone, and we have no staff, no stay. I cannot weep for all my body's moisture, scarce serves to quench my furnace burning heart. Richard, I bear thy name, I'll avenge thy death, or die renowned by attempting it. His name that valiant duke hath left with thee, his dukedom and his chair with me is left. Nay, if thou be that princely eagle's bird, show thy descent by gazing against the sun, for chair and dukedom, throne and kingdom say, Either that is thine, or else thou wert not his. How now, fair lords? What fair? What news abroad? Oh, Warwick, Warwick, that Plantagenet, which held thee dearly as his soul's redemption is by the stern Lord Clifford, done to death. Ten days ago, I drowned these news in tears. I... Then in London, keeper of the king, mustered my soldiers, gathered flocks of friends, and very well appointed, as I thought, marched towards St. Albans to intercept the queen, bearing the king in my behalf along, for by my scouts I was advertised that she was coming with a full intent to dash our late decree in Parliament, touching King Henry's oath and your succession. Short tale to make, we at St. Albans met, our battles joined, and both sides fiercely fought, but... Whether it was the coldness of the king, who looked full gently on his warlike queen, that robbed my soldiers of their heated spleen, or whether it was report of her success, or more than common fear of Clifford's rigour, I cannot judge. But to conclude with truth, they had no heart to fight, and we in them no hope to win the day. So that we fled, the king unto the queen, Lord George, your brother, Norfolk, and myself, in haste, post-haste, are come to join with you. For in the marches here we heard you were making another head to fight again. Where is the Duke of Norfolk, gentle Warwick? And when came George from Burgundy to England? Some six miles off, the Duke is, with the soldiers. And for your brother, he was lately sent from your kind aunt, Duchess of Burgundy, with aid of soldiers to this needful war. So as odds be like when valiant Warwick fled, Oft have I heard his praises in pursuit, but ne'er till now his scandal of retire. Nor now, my scandal, Richard, dost thou hear. For thou shalt know, this strong right hand of mine can pluck the diadem from faint Henry's head. I know it well, Lord Warwick, blame me not. Tis love I bear thy glories make me speak. But in this troublous time, what's to be done? Shall we go throw away our coats of steel and wrap our bodies in black morning gowns, numbering our Ave Maria's with our beads? Or shall we, with helmets on our foes, tell our devotion with revengeful arms? If for the last, say I, and to it, lords. Why, therefore Warwick came to seek you out, and therefore comes my brother Montague. Attend me, lords. 
the proud insulting queen with Clifford and the haught Northumberland have wrought the easy melting king like wax. He swore consent to your succession, his oath enrolled in the parliament. And now to London all the crew are gone to frustrate both his oath and what beside may make against the house of Lancaster. Their power, I think, is 30,000 strong. Now, if the help of Norfolk and myself with all the friends that thou, brave Earl of March, amongst the loving Welshmen canst procure, will but amount to five and twenty thousand. Why, Via, to London will we march, and once again bestride our foaming steeds, and once again cry charge upon our foes, but never once again turn back and fly. Ay, now methinks I hear great Warwick speak. Lord Warwick, on thy shoulder, I will lean. No longer Earl of March, but Duke of York. The next degree is England's royal throne. For King of England shalt thou be proclaimed in every borough as we pass along. And he that throws not up his cap for joy shall for the fault make forfeit of his head. Then strike up, John. God and St. George for us. <laughs> How now? What news? The Duke of Norfolk sends you word by me the Queen is coming with a puissant host and craves your company for speedy counsel. Why, then it sorts, brave warriors. Let's away. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 2, Before York. Enter King Henry, Queen Margaret, Clifford, Northumberland and young Prince Edward. Welcome, my lord, to this brave town of York. Yonder is the head of that arch enemy that sought to be encompassed with your crown. Does not the object cheer your heart, my lord? I oh, have the rock fear and the fear their rack. To see this sight, it irks my very soul. Withhold revenge, dear God, tis not my fault, nor wittingly have I infringed my vow. My gracious liege, this too much lenity and harmful pity must be laid aside. Ambitious York did level at thy crown, thou smiling while he knit his angry brows. He, but a duke, would have his son a king, and raise his issue like a loving sire. Thou, being a king, blessed with a goodly son, didst yield consent to disinherit him. Were it not a pity that this goodly boy should lose his birthright by his father's fault and long hereafter say unto his child, what my great-grandfather and grandsire got, my careless father fondly gave away. Ah, oh, what a shame were this. Look on the boy. All well hath Clifford played the orator, inferring arguments of mighty force. But, Clifford, tell me, didst thou never hear that things ill got had ever bad success? Ah, cousin York, would thy best friends did know how it doth grieve me that thy head is there. My lord, cheer up your spirits, our foes are nigh, and this soft courage makes your followers faint. You promised knighthood to our forward son, unsheath your sword and dub him presently. Edward, kneel down. Edward Plantagenet. Arise, a knight, and learn this lesson. Draw thy sword in right. My gracious father, by your kingly leave, I'll draw it as apparent to the crown, and in that quarrel, use it to the death. Why, that is spoken like a toward prince. Royal commanders, be in readiness, for with a band of 30,000 men comes Warwick, backing up the Duke of York, and in the towns, as they do, march along and proclaims him king, and many fly to him, drain your battle, for they are at hand. I would, your highness, would depart the field. The queen hath best success when you are absent. Aye, good, my lord, and leave us to our fortune. Why, that's my fortune too, therefore I'll stay. Be it with resolution then to fight. My royal father, cheer these noble lords and hearten those that fight in your defence. Unsheathe your sword, good father. Cry, Saint George! Saint, Saint George! George! <laughs> Ye 
Now, perjured Henry, wilt thou kneel for grace and set thy diadem upon thy head, or bide the mortal fortune of the field? Go rate thy minions, proud, insulting boy. I am his king, and he should bow his knee. I was adopted heir by his consent, since when his oath is broke, for as I hear, you that are king, though he do wear the crown, have caused him by new act of parliament to blot out me and put his own son in. And reason too. Who should succeed the father but the son? Are you there, butcher? Oh, I cannot speak. I crook back, here I stand to answer thee, or any he, the proudest of thy sort. Twas you that killed young Rutland, was it not? Aye, and old York, and yet not satisfied. For God's sake, lords, give signal to the fight. What sayst thou, Henry? Wilt thou yield the crown? Why, how now, long tongued Warwick, dare you speak? When you and I met at St. Albans last, your legs did better service than your hands. <laughs> then twas my turn to fly, and now tis thine. You said so much before, and yet you fled. Was not your valour, Clifford, drove me hence? No, nor your manhood that durst make you stay. Northumberland, I hold thee reverently. Break off the parley, for scarce I can refrain the execution of my big swollen heart upon that Clifford, the cruel child killer. I slew thy father. Callst thou him a child? Aye, like a dastard and a treacherous coward, as thou didst kill our tender brother Rutland. But ere sunset, I'll make thee curse the deed. Go with words, my lords, and hear me speak. Defy them then, or else hold close thy lips. I prithee give no limit to my tongue. I am a king and privileged to speak. My liege, the wound that bred this meeting here cannot be cured by words. Therefore, be still. Then, executioner, unsheath thy sword. By him that made us all, I am resolved that Clifford's manhood lies upon his tongue. Say, Henry, shall I have my right or no? A thousand men have broke their fast today that ne'er shall dine unless thou yield the crown. If thou deny their blood upon thy head, for York in justice puts his armour on. If that be right, which Warwick says is right, there is no wrong, but everything is right. Whoever got thee there, thy mother stands. For well I wot, thou hast thy mother's tongue. And thou art neither like thy sire nor dam, but like a foul, misshapen, stagmatic, marked by the destinies to be avoided uh, as venom toads or lizards' dreadful stings. A wisp of straw were worth a thousand crowns to make this shameless callant know herself. And in this resolution I defy thee, not willing longer conference. Since thou denied the gentle king to speak, sound trumpets, let out our bloody colors wave, and either victory or else a grave. Stay, Edward. No wrangling woman will no longer stay. These words will cost 10,000 lives today. Exeunt, act two, scene three, Yorkshire, a battlefield between Toton and Saxton. Enter Warwick. <laughs> All spent with toil, as runners with a race. I lay me down a little while to breathe, for strokes received and many blows repaid have robbed my strong knit sinews of their strength, and spite of spite needs must I rest a while. Fire, gentle heaven, or strike on gentle death, for this world frowns and Edward's son is cloaked. Oh, how now, my lord? What hap? What hope of good? Our hap is lost, our hope but sad despair. Our ranks are broke, and ruin follows us. What counsel give you? Whither shall we fly? Oh, this flight, they follow us with wings, and weak we are, and cannot shun pursuit. Ah, Warwick, why hast thou withdrawn thyself? Thy brothers first the earth have drunk, broached with the steely point of Clifford's lance. Here, on my knee, I vow to God above, I'll never pause again, never stand still, till either death hath closed these eyes of mine, or fortune given me measure of revenge. The work, I do bend my knee with thine, and in this vow do chain my soul to thine. Now, Lord, take leave until we meet again, where'er it be in heaven or in earth. Brother, give me thy hand, and gentle Warwick, 
let me embrace thee in my weary arms. I that did never weep now melt with woe, that winter should cut off our springtime so. Away, away, once more, sweet lords, farewell. Exeunt. Act two, scene four. Yorkshire, another part of the field between Toton and Saxton. Enter Richard at one door and Clifford at the other. I have singled thee alone. Now, Richard, I am with thee here alone. This is the hand that stabbed thy father York, and this the hand that slew thy brother Rutland. And here's the heart that triumphs in their death, and cheers these hands that slew thy sire and brother to execute the like upon thyself, and so have at thee! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Nay, Warwick, single out some other chase, for I myself will hunt this wolf to death. Oh. Act two, scene five, Yorkshire, another part of the field between Toton and Saxton. Enter King Henry alone. Fares like to the morning's war, when dying clouds contend with growing light. What can the shepherd blowing of his nails can neither call a perfect day nor night? Here on this molehill will I sit me down. To whom God will, there be the victory. Margaret, my queen, and Clifford too, hid me from the battle, swearing both they prosper best of all when I am thence. Would I were dead? God's good will was so. What is in this world but grief and woe? Oh God, methinks it were a happy life to be no better than a homely swain, to sit upon a hill as I do now, to carve out dials quaintly, point by point, thereby to see the minutes how they run. How many makes the hour full complete? How many hours brings about the day? How many days will finish up the year? How many years a mortal man may live? When this is known, then to divide the times. So many hours must I tend my flock. So many hours must I take my rest. So many hours must I contemplate. So many hours must I sport myself. Ah, a life with this. How sweet, how lovely. It's not the hawthorn bush a sweeter shade to shepherds looking on their silly sheep than doth a rich embroidered canopy to kings that fear their subjects' treachery. Oh yes, it doth. A thousandfold it doth. And to conclude, the shepherd's homely curds, his cold, thin drink out of his leather bottle, wanted sleep under a fresh tree's shade, all which secure and sweetly he enjoys, is far beyond a prince's delicates, when care, mistrust, and treason wait on him. Ill blows the wind that profits nobody. This man, whom hand to hand I slew in fight, may be possessed with some store of crowns, and I, that haply take them from him now, may yet ere night yield both my life and them to some man else, as this dead man doth me. Who's this? Oh God, tis my father's face. And I, who at his hands received my life, have by my hands of life bereaved him. Look. Pardon me, God, I knew not what I did. And pardon me, Father, for I knew not thee. 
my tears shall wipe away these bloody marks, and no more words till they have flowed their fill. Weep, wretched man, I'll aid thee tear for tear, and let our hearts and eyes like civil war be blind with tears and break o'ercharged with grief. Thou that hast so stoutly resisted me, give me thy gold, <laughs> if thou hast any gold. I have bought it with an hundred blows. Is this our foeman's face? Oh no, 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 it is mine only son. Oh, pity God this miserable age. What stratagems, how fell, how butcherly erroneous mutinous and unnatural this deadly quarrel doth daily forget. Oh boy, thy father gave thee life too soon, and hath bereft thee of thy life too late. How will my mother for a father's death take on with me and ne'er be satisfied? How will my wife for slaughter of my son shed seas of tears and ne'er be satisfied? How will the country for these woeful chances misthink the king and not be satisfied? Was ever son so rude a father's death? Was it the father so bemoaned his son? Was ever king so grieved for subjects' woe? Much is your sorrow, mine ten times so much. I'll bear thee hence, where I may weep my fill. These arms of mine shall be thy winding sheet. My heart, sweet boy, shall be thy sepulchre. I'll bear thee hence, and let them fight that will. For I have murdered where I should not kill. Sad hearted men, much overgone with care. Here sits a king more woeful than you are. Fly, father, fly! For all your friends have fled, and Warwick rages like a chafed bull. Away! The death doth hold us in pursuit. Mount you, my lord, towards Berwick post amain. Away! Take away! Me with, take me with thee, good Exeter. Not that I fear to stay, but love to go, whither the Queen intends. Forward, away! Exeunt. Act Two, Scene Six. Yorkshire. Another part of the battlefield between Toton and Saxton. Enter Clifford, wounded, with an arrow in his neck. Here burns my candle out. I hear it dies which whilst it lasted gave King Henry light. The common people swarm like summer flies, and whither fly the gnats but to the sun? And who shines now but Henry's enemies? And Henry, ah, hadst thou swayed as kings should do, or as thy father and his father did, never giving no ground unto the house of York, they never then had sprung like summer flies. I and ten thousand in this luckless realm had left no mourning widows for our death, and thou this day hadst kept thy chair in peace. The foe is merciless and will not pity, for at their hands I have deserved no pity. The air hath got into my deadly wounds, and much effuse of blood doth make me faint. Come, York and Richard, Warwick and the rest, I stabbed your father's bosoms, split my breast. Now breathe we, lords, good fortune bids us pause and smooth the frowns of war with peaceful looks. Thank you, Lord, said Clifford fled with him? No, tis impossible he should escape, for though before his face I speak the words, your brother Richard marked him for the grave, and wheresoe'er he is, he's surely dead. <sighs> Whose soul is that which takes her heavy leave? A deadly groan like death and life's departing. See who it is. Now the battle's ended. If friend or fro, let him be gently used. Revoke that doom of mercy, for tis Clifford. 
from off the gates of York, fetch down their head, your father's head, which Clifford placed there, instead whereof let this supply the room. Measure for measure must be answered. Clifford, ask mercy and obtain no grace. Clifford, repent in bootless penitence. Clifford, devise excuses for thy faults. Where's Captain Margaret to fence you now? They mock thee, Clifford, swear as thou wast wont. What? Not an oath? Nay, then the world goes hard when Clifford cannot spare his friends an oath. Aye, but he's dead. Off with the traitor's head, and rear it in the place your father stands. And now, to London, with triumphant march, there to be crowned England's royal king. From <coughs> Shall Warwick cut the sea to France and ask the Lady Bona for thy queen? So shalt thou sinnow both these lands together, and having France thy friend, thou shalt not dread that scattered foe that hopes to rise again. First will I see the coronation, and then to Brittany I'll cross the sea to effect this marriage. So it please, my lord. Even as thou wilt, sweet Warwick, let it be, for in my shoulder I do build my seat. Richard? I will create thee Duke of Gloucester, and George of Clarence. Warwick as ourself shall do and undo as him pleaseth best. Let me be Duke of Clarence, George of Gloucester, for, for Gloucester's dukedom is too ominous. That's a foolish observation. Richard, be Duke of Gloucester. Now, to London, to see these honours in possession. Exeunt. Act three, scene one. A forest in the north of England. Enter two gamekeepers with crossbows in their hands. Under this thick grown brake we'll shroud ourselves, for through this land and on the deer will come. Here comes a man. Let's stay till he be passed. From Scotland am I stolen, even of pure love, to greet mine own land with my wishful sight. No. Harry, Harry, tis no land of thine. Thy place is filled, thy sceptre wrung from thee. Aye, here's a deer who skins a keeper's fee. This is the quondam king. Let's seize upon him. Let me embrace these sour adversities, for wise men say it is the wisest course. Yet why linger we? Let us lay hands upon him. For e'er a while, we'll hear a little more. My queen and son are gone to France for aid. And as I hear, the great commanding Warwick is thither gone to crave the French king's sister to wife for Edward. If this news be true, poor queen and son, your labour is but lost. Say, what art thou that talkest of kings and queens? More than I seem and less than I was born to. A man at least, for less I should not be. And men may talk of kings, and why not I? Aye, but thou talkest as if thou wert a king. Why, so I am in mind, and that's enough. But if thou be a king, where is thy crown? <laughs> my, my crown is in my heart. It is called content. A crown it is that seldom kings enjoy. Well, if you be a king crowned with content, your crown content and you must be contented to go along with us. For as we think you are the king, King Edward hath deposed, and with his subjects born in all allegiance, will apprehend you as his enemy. But did you never swear and break an oath? <laughs> no, never such an oath, nor will not now. Where did you dwell when I was King of England? Here in this country, where we now remain. I was anointed king at nine months old. My father and my grandfather were kings, and you were sworn true subjects unto me. And tell me then, have you not broke your oaths? No. <laughs> For we were subjects, but while you were king. Why? Am I dead? Do I not breathe a man? Ah, simple men, you know not what you swear. Go where you will, the king shall be commanded. And be you kings, command, and I'll obey. We are true subjects to the king, King Edward. So would you be again unto Henry, if he were seated as King Edward is? We charge you in God's name and the kings to go with us unto the officers. In God's name lead. Your king's name be obeyed, and what God will, that let, that, that let your king perform, and what he will, I humbly yield unto. Exeunt. Act three, scene two. London. A palace room. Enter King Edward, Gloucester, Clarence, Lady Grey.
brother of Gloucester at St. Albans Field, this lady's husband, Sir Richard Gray, was slain, his land then seized upon by the conqueror. Her suit is now to repossess those lands. Your highness shall do well to grant her suit. It were dishonor to deny it her. Or no less, but yet I'll make a pause. Yea, is it so? I see the lady had a thing to grant before the king will grant her humble suit. He knows the game, how true he keeps the wind. <laughs> Silence. Widow, we will consider of your suit and come some other time to know our mind. Right gracious lord, I cannot brook delay. May it please your highness to resolve me now and what your pleasure is shall satisfy me. Aye, widow. Then I'll warrant you all your lands, and if what pleases him shall pleasure you, fight closer, or good faith you'll catch a blow. I fear her not, unless she chance to fall. God forbid that, for he'll take vantages. How many children hast thou, widow? Tell me. Three, my most gracious lord. You shall have four, and if you'll be ruled by him. For pity they should lose their father's lands. Be pitiful, dread lord, and grant it then. Lords, give us leave. I'll try this widow's wit. I good leave have you, for you will have leave till you take leave and leave you to the crut. Mm -hmm. Now tell me, madam, do you love your children? Aye, full as dearly as I love myself. And would you not do much to do them good? To do them good, I would sustain some harm. Ah, then get your husband's lands to do them good. Therefore, I came unto your majesty. I'll tell you how these lands are to be got. So shall you bind me to your highness' service? What service wilt thou do me if I give them? What you command that rests in me to do. Uh, but you will take exceptions to my boon. No, gracious lord, except I cannot do it. Aye, but thou canst do what I mean to ask. Why then, I will do what your grace commands. He plies her hard and much rain wears the marble. <laughs> as red as fire? Nay then. Her wax must melt. Why stops, my lord? Shall I not hear my task? An easy task. Tis but to love a king. That's soon performed, because I am a subject. Why then, thy husband's lands, I freely give thee. I take my leave, with many thousand thanks. Uh, uh, but stay thee. Uh, Tis the fruits of love, I mean. The fruits of love, I mean, my loving liege. Aye, but I fear me in another sense. What love thinks thou I sue so much to get? My love till death, my humble thanks, my prayers, that love which virtue begs and virtue grants. No, by my troth, I did not mean such love. Why then you mean not as I thought you did. Ah, but now you partly may perceive my mind. My mind will never grant, grant what I perceive your highness aims at, if I aim aright. To tell thee plain, I aim to lie with thee. To tell thee plain, I had rather lie in prison. Why then thou shalt not have thy husband's lands. Why then mine honesty shall be my dower, for by that loss I will not purchase them. Therein thou wrongs thy children mightily. Therein your highness wrongs both them and me. But mighty lord, this merry inclination accords not with the sadness of my suit. Please you dismiss me either with I or no. Aye. Uh, if thou wilt say I to my request. No, if thou dost say no to my demand. Then no, my lord, my suit is at an end. He is the bluntest wooer in Christendom. Her looks doth argue her replete with modesty. Her words doth show her wit incomparable. All her perfections challenge sovereignty. Ah, one way or another, she is for a king, and she shall be my love or else my queen. Say that King Edward take thee for his queen. Tis better said than done, my gracious lord. I am subject fit to jest with all, but far unfit to be a sovereign. Sweet widow, by my state, I swear to thee, I speak no more than what my soul intends, and that is to enjoy thee for my love. And that is more than I will yield unto. I know I am too mean to be your queen, and yet too good to be your concubine. You cavil, Willow, I did mean my queen. To grieve your grace, my sons should call you father. No more than when my daughters call thee mother, thou art a widow, and thou hast some children, and by God's mother, I, but being a bachelor, had other some. Why, tis a happy thing to be the father unto so many sons. Answer no more, but thou shalt be my queen. Brothers, you muse what chat we two have had. 
the widow likes it not for she looks very sad. You think it strange if I should marry her? To who, my lord? Why, Clarence, to myself. That would be ten days' wonder at the least. That's a day's longer than a wonder lasts. Why so much is the wonder in extremes? Well, just on, brothers. I can tell you both, pursuit is granted for a husband's lance. Oh, my gracious lord, Henry, your foe is taken and brought your prisoner to your palace gate. See that he be conveyed into the tower, and go we brothers to the man that took him to question of his apprehension. Widow, go you along. Lords, use her honorably. I, Edward will use women honorably. <laughs> Would he were wasted marrow bones and all, that from his loins no hopeful branch may spring to cross from me from the golden time I look for. And yet, between my soul's desire and me, the lust for the, Edward's title buried is Clarence, Henry, and his son, young Edward, and all the unlooked for issue of their bodies to take their rooms ere I can place myself a cold premeditation for my purpose. <laughs> Why then, I do but dream on sovereignty. My eyes too quick, my heart over wings too much. Unless my hand and strength could equal them. <laughs> well, say there is no kingdom then for Richard. What other pleasure can the world afford? I'll make my heaven in a lady's lap and deck my body in gay ornaments and witch sweet ladies with my words and looks. Oh, miserable thought! Oh, and more unlikely than to accomplish 20 golden crowns. Why, love forswore me in my mother's womb and for I should not deal in her soft laws. She did corrupt fail nature with some bride to disproportion me in every part like to a chaos or an unlicked bear whelp that carries no impression like the dam. And am I then a man to be beloved? Oh, monstrous fault to harbor such a thought. Then since this earth affords no joy to me, but to command, to check, to overbear such as are a better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. And whilst I live to account this world but hell, until my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impelled with a glorious crown. Oh, and yet I know not how to get the crown. For many lives stand between me and home. Why I can smile and murder whilst I smile and cry content to that which grieves my heart and wet my cheeks with artificial tears and frame my face to all occasions. Ah, <laughs> can I do this and cannot get a crown? Tut, were it farther off, I'd pluck it down. Exit, act three, scene three, France. <laughs> A room in King Louis XI's palace. Enter Louis, the French king, his sister, Lady Bona, his admiral, called Bourbon, Prince Edward, Queen Margaret, and the Earl of Oxford. Fair Queen of England, worthy Margaret, Sit down with us, it ill befits thy state and birth that thou should stand while Louis doth sit. No, mighty king of France, now Margaret must strike her sail and learn a while to serve where kings command. I was, I must confess, great Albion's queen in former golden days, but now mischance hath trod my title down. Why, say, fair queen, whence springs this deep despair? from such a cause as fills mine eyes with tears and stops my tongue while heart is drowned in cares. Whatever it be, be thou still like thyself and sit thee by our side. <laughs> Yield not thy neck to fortune's yoke, but let thy dauntless mind still ride in triumph over all mischance. Be plain, Queen Margaret, and tell thy grief 
it shall be eased if France can yield relief. Those gracious words revive my drooping thoughts. Now, therefore, be it known to noble Louis that Henry, sole possessor of my love, is of a king become a banished man and forced to live in Scotland a forlorn, while proud, ambitious Edward, Duke of York, usurps the regal title and the seat of England's true anointed lawful king. This is the cause that I, poor Margaret, with my son, Prince Edward Henry's heir, am come to crave thy just and lawful aid. And if thou fail us, all our hope is done. Renowned queen, with patience calm the storm, while we bethink a means to break it off. The more we stay, the stronger grows our foe. The more I stay, the more I'll succor thee. Oh, but impatience waiteth on true sorrow. And see where comes the breeder of my sorrow. What he approacheth boldly to our present. Our Earl of Warwick, Edward's greatest friend. Welcome, brave Warwick. What brings thee to France? From worthy Edward, King of Albion, my lord and sovereign, and thy vowed friend, I come in kindness and unfeigned love, first to do greetings to thy royal person, and then to crave a league of amity, and lastly to confirm that amity with nuptial knot, if thou vouchsafe to grant that virtuous Lady Bona, thy fair sister, to King England's king in lawful marriage. And gracious madam, in our king's behalf, I am commanded with your leave and favour humbly to kiss your hand. And with my tongue to tell the passion of my sovereign's heart, where fame, late entering at his heedful ears, hath placed thy beauty's image and thy virtue. King Louis and Lady Bonner, hear me speak before you answer Warwick. His demand springs not from Edward's well-meant honest love, but from deceit bred by necessity. For how can tyrants safely govern home unless abroad they purchase great alliance? Injurious, Margaret. And why not, Queen? Because thy father, Henry, did usurp, and thou no more art prince than she is queen. Queen Margaret, Prince Edward and Oxford, vouchsafe at our request to stand aside while I use further conference with Warwick. Heavens grant that Warwick's word be which him not. Now, Warwick, tell me, even upon thy conscience, is Edward your true king? For I were loath to link with him that were not lawfully chosen. Thereon I pawn my credit and mine honour. But is he gracious in the people's eye? Well, the more that Henry was unfortunate. The further, all dissembling set aside, tell me for truth the measure of his love unto our sister Bona. Oh, such it seems as may beseem a monarch like himself. Now, sister, let us hear your firm resolve. Your grant or your denial shall be mine. Yet I confess that often ere this day, when I have heard your king's desert recounted, mine ear hath tempted judgment to desire. Then, Warwick, thus, our sister shall be Edward's, and now forthwith shall articles be drawn touching the jointer that your king must make, which with her dowry shall be counterposed. Draw near, Queen Margaret, and be a witness that Bona shall be wife to the English king. Mm. Edward, but not to the English king. Deceitful, Warwick, it was thy device by this alliance to make void my suit. Before thy king, Louis was Henry's friend. And still is friend to him and Margaret. But if your title to the crown be weak, as may appear by Edward's good success, then tis but reason that I be released from giving aid, which late I promised. Henry now lives in Scotland at his ease, where having nothing, nothing can he lose. And as for you yourself, our quondam queen, you have a father able to maintain you, and better twere you troubled him than France. Peace, impertinent, shameless Warwick, proud set her up and pull her down of kings. I will not hence till with my talk and tears both full of truth I make King Louis behold thy sly conveyance and thy lord's false love, for both of you are birds of self-same feather. Warwick, this is some post to us, or thee. Uh, my Lord Ambassador, these letters are for you. Uh, sent from your brother, Marcus Montague, these from 
our king unto your majesty. And, and madam, these are for you, from whom I, I know not. I like it well that our fair queen mistress smiles at their, their news, while Warwick frowns at his. War Warwick, what best. are thy news and yours, fair queen? Oh, mine such as fill my heart with unhoped joys. Mine full of sorrow and heart's discontent. What? Has your king married the Lady Grey, and now to soothe your forgery and his, sends me a paper to persuade me patience? Is this the alliance that he seeks with France? There he presumed to scorn us in this manner. I told your majesty as much before, that proveth Edward's love and Warwick's honesty. King Louis, I here protest in sight of heaven, and by the hope I have of heavenly bliss, that I am clear from this misdeed of Edward's. No more my king, for he dishonours me, but most himself, if he could see his shame. Oh, shame on himself, for my desert is honour and to repair my honour lost for him, I here renounce him and return to Henry. My noble queen, let former grudges pass, and henceforth I am thy true servitor. I will revenge his wrong to Lady Bona and replant Henry in his former state. Warwick, these words have turned my hate to love, and I forgive and quite forget old faults, and joy that thou become King Henry's friend. So much his friend, I, his unfeigned friend, that if King Louis vouchsafe to furnish us with some few bands of chosen soldiers, I'll undertake them to land on our coast, and force the tyrant from his seat by war. Dear brother, how shall Bonner be revenged, but by thy help to this distressed queen? Renowned prince, how shall poor Henry live unless thou rescue him from foul despair? My quarrel and this English queen's are one. And mine, fair Lady Bona, joins with yours. And mine with hers, and thine, and Margaret's. Therefore, at last I firmly am resolved. You shall have hate. Let me give humble thanks to all at once. Then England's messenger, return in post, and tell false Edward, thy supposed king, that Louis of France is sending over Masquerous to revel it with him and his new bride. <laughs> tell him from me that he hath done me wrong, and therefore I'll uncrown him, it be long. There's thy reward. Be gone. But Warwick, Thou and Oxford, with five thousand men, shall cross the seas and bid false Edward battle. And as occasion serves, this noble queen and prince shall follow with a fresh supply. Yet, ere thou go, but answer me one doubt. What pledge have we of thy firm loyalty? This shall assure my constant loyalty, that if our queen and this young prince agree, I'll join mine eldest daughter and my joy to him forthwith in holy wedlock bands. Yes, I agree and thank you for your motion. Son Edward, she is fair and virtuous. Therefore delay not, give thy hand to Warwick and with thy hand thy faith irrevocable that only Warwick's daughter shall be thine. Yes, I accept her for she well deserves it. And here to pledge my vow, I give my hand. Why stay we now? These soldiers shall be levied, and thou, Lord Bobbin, our High Admiral, shall waft them over with our royal fleet. I long till Edward fall by war's mischance for mocking marriage with a dame of France. I came from Edward as ambassador, but I return his sworn and mortal foe. Matter of marriage was the charge he gave me, but dreadful war shall answer his demand. Had he none else to make a stale but me, then none but I shall turn his jest to sorrow. I was the chief that raised him to the crown, and I'll be chief to bring him down again. Not that I pity Henry's misery, but seek revenge on Edward's mockery. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our interval. So please take uh, a couple of minutes to refresh yourselves, refresh your drinks, uh, send in some questions as well if you have them for the actors. Equally, actors, if you want to take a break at this point, please do. Uh, otherwise, feel free to join in with our chat. And I see we already have uh, the valiant Clifford, who uh, doesn't have anything to prepare for for the second half. So <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. The after party in the afterlife. <laughs> what a way to go, eh? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well done on being able to get all those words out with an arrow through your neck as well. I think that's a particularly impressive feat of Shakespeare's dramaturgy there. But we were saying in rehearsal, weren't we, that you know this, the original monologue's even longer than that. So it's like, how does he say so much? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. What's that, Bernard? It was a, a very thin arrow, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't feel thin. Flesh wound. There's jam everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. So, uh, our audience, by the way, have been loving it all the way through. Uh, there's been some amazing comments coming through. Uh, we'll try and feed some of those back to you as we go. Uh, Sarah, do we have any questions for our cast and crew? Uh, yes, I do. So, um, one thing I, I wanted to just quickly answer um, that someone mentioned, I think, in the chat earlier was about uh, this being live. And uh, someone very kindly answered, but yes, just, just to let anyone new who's t tuning in this week that we are live here. Everyone in the cast is um, performing from their own homes in various parts of the world. Um, I think the award for furthest uh, person joining us today goes to Russell, who is in Australia, um, which is amazing. But we've got the US, we've got UK, we've got uh, Canada, uh, we've got Spain, Turkey. Um, I'm not sure if I missed any others, but yes, we are very, very global and very live. <laughs> um, so one of the questions I had uh, was, uh, what was the most surprising part uh, for the actors um, in rehearsal? Wonderful question the commitment that everyone um, was making themselves readily available to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse when possible, as many people in a scene that we could get. Um, and then it's amazing to see theatre be put on this medium and then try and adjust it to for screen value, but yet portray it as truthfully as Shakespeare had written it for a stage. Um, I think that's been a big surprise. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a, it's a really interesting blend, isn't it, of almost like yeah. radio work, TV work, theatre work. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of taking different bits from each one. Absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think it's good that there's lots of people from um, around the world because then you can meet new people as well. Like, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, mate. Absolutely. And thank you, Scarlett, for your uh, incredibly moving performance. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tears flowing in the audience. <laughs> I'm so <Amazing>. sorry. <laughs> me. It's like just going around killing a 12 year old, you know, that's normal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's the terrifying it's new normal in this in this play, isn't it? That we've kind of we've been on this downward spiral for three plays now and, and we're really kind of plumbing the depths of what people are capable of. It's it really is quite tough. Uh, next any more questions? Next week's now? a lot lighter, though, at least. <laughs> yes, yes, with Titus Andronicus. It's funny you should mention that, actually. Yeah. Next week coming up is Titus Andronicus. Uh, and it was funny that Owen, in his introduction, mentioned Quentin Tarantino, because if you wanted a Quentin Tarantino version of Shakespeare, Titus Andronicus is it. Uh, it is uh, violent and gory in the extreme, so we're already very excited about what we can do with that. So please tune in next week and subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to get updated. Uh, ahead of that thank you so much Absolutely. Um, and just to add to that actually someone asked um, on the, the subject of the show when are we doing Richard the um, third well we're doing Richard the third the week after so we've got Titus Andronicus next week and then the week after Richard the third we are incredibly excited about it we can't wait uh, to start the process of putting that show together but as w the way that we do these things um, you know we're, we're doing one show a week which is quite an intense <laughs> rehearsal schedule uh, so we're kind of really zeroed in on uh, Titus Andronicus right now. But yes, very much looking forward to Richard III in two weeks' time. Cool. So, um, oh yeah, so there's a question here about um, whether, and please jump in anyone, uh, whether the history plays are different to doing another kind of Shakespeare. So, the actors, what's your experience of doing histories versus tragedies or comedies? 
I, I remember the first time I got to do the histories properly. I think for, for, for ages I'd sort of uh, avoided them because I just assumed oh, there'll be a lot of lengthy speeches of, of many different elderly lords waffling on at great length and not much happens. And then once I actually finally got around to getting involved in the histories, I did the full Wars the Roses um, production, which was all everything from Richard II through to Richard III. Third. suddenly realized, no, they're probably, probably the most exciting plays in the whole canon. Um, because so much happens, so much there's so much action, so many so many betrayals. More to come. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that um, it, I I always sort of steer clear of the histories. Um, and so you know, there's lots of amazing speeches that are very famous, um, like the Twelfth Nights and Romeo and Juliet. So and Othello and I sort of went down that route and then actually realized recently how many amazing speeches there are for late well for all but especially for women um in the histories so yeah I'm, I wish I'd got there sooner <laughs> and not just that it's so um it's so rich I feel like listening to it and watching it now the history plays seem so much more modern it seems like when we're talking when I'm hearing these speeches that it's not 400 years old but it like really urgently relevant yeah absolutely i think there's something really curious about the language on this one uh, in how accessible it is and uh, you know owen talked about that directness that quality that they have um and there are large parts of this play where i almost forget that we're listening to shakespeare uh, you know it's only those kind of rhythms that uh, that keep that pulse going through it that make it almost identifiable in that way otherwise it could just as easily be game of thrones yeah can you hear that Yes, hi Lee. Thanks yes. for joining us. <laughs> well, my videos and the, the rest of it. Um, um, apparently. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's good. Um, it's not particularly funny, though, I think. <laughs> There's not a lot of laughter in it, light in it, is my. Although there are a couple of. Scene. We managed to eke out some moments, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I uh, particularly fans, uh, our audience having uh, ma many, many applause for our uh, hunters in the forest uh, yeah. and our French court as well. Yeah, yeah, really enjoying that. Any other questions, Sarah? Coming yes. In? Um, so, oh, um, let's go with that one. So, um, what do the actors do to prepare for this? <laughs> Turn my flat up. <laughs> Side down. Yeah, I wish you could also see the setup that we each individually have right now. I mean, I'm currently propped up on an ironing board with many things surrounding me. So it's not just the text, which is obviously needs a lot of time within itself, but it's the makeshift studios that get created in all of our homes across the world. And I mean, it's carnage now. It was organized at the beginning, but now it's just my, my flat floor is now covered in jam and soil, basically. <laughs> it's true, one of the things I didn't prepare for was the light coming through the kitchen window. <laughs> I also love the sort of how it takes you back to arts and crafts and all the things that you didn't think you remembered. You kind of go, oh, I know how I can make that. I know how I can make that. And then suddenly you're like, great. Yeah, there is something, something about being a child. To be honest, yeah. like because we are playing with child, but I think we all are a bit children here. <laughs> like this, really <laughs> playing with everything. Oh, I find this this knife. I find these slides. It, it's really crazy. Yeah, I have to say, while I was working, my fiance was the one who made my oh, wonderful no. crossbow. So Kelly, a big thank you to her. So what I did to prepare was delegate. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Also made my rose. Maybe time for I, one I, or two more. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I just yeah. want to give, um, uh, yeah. ironically, props to uh, Emily Ingram, um, our associate stage manager, for for brilliant tutorials and everything on how to make some of the yeah. more complicated things like crossbow. So, massive, massive thank you to Emily. Um, oh, yeah. It's brilliant. Thank you. So good. Um, so I've got one. Let me see. Mm, okay. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So one for uh, for Warwick. So for you, Ali. Um, what do you think Warwick is feeling or thinking of after Edward humiliates him? Uh, because he's still Yorkist, but he his honour uh, means more to him. So, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think 
Well, I think all the way through, um, Warwick is about justice. I think he starts off on the side of the Yorkists because he believes that's the right cause. And he only switches sides when there's a personal betrayal. And I think he takes that very badly. I think he's very um, quick to anger and quick to revenge when someone betrays him. So I think it's a kind of an instant, okay, right, I am out of your hair and then it's very quick thinking of what can i do to salvage this situation and come out with as much power as possible great i'm going to go back to the other side and uh, and then on to i think i'm on about plan d by this point i mean sort of you know every other scene it's a new plan and then we're carrying out that plan and then all oh, no, the plan goes wrong so quick new plan and um, so i think yeah at this point he's he's uh, very angry but he's got another mission and he's going to carry that out because that's what he does Wonderful, wonderful. Maybe time for one more? I was going to say, yeah, and I've also got a couple of shout-outs to do. Absolutely, let's do the shout-outs. Right. Should we do shout-outs? Yeah. Yes. In fact, actors, if... we're probably on about two minutes until we start again, so if you guys would like to uh, return to the tiring house in preparation <laughs> for the second half, and we'll just do our bit of uh, usual business at this point. Thank you so much. Yes. Awesome. So, um, first of all, um, I want to give a, a quick little shout out um, to a class um, who've been watching us. So this is for Central Franklin CC Challenge 1. Thank you so much for tuning into our shows. We re really appreciate you watching um, and uh, yeah, hope you've been enjoying them. Say hello to us in the chat. <laughs> um, so we also wanted to say hello um, to our wonderful, wonderful patrons. So uh, we have a patron page uh, that we were asked to set up by a wonderful audience. So thank you. Um, and uh, the link is in the description of the video if you would like to contribute something to our opt-in hardship fund for everyone involved in this project. Um, so I want to give a shout out to our new patrons this week. Um, so we have Janet L. Massive thank you for your very generous contribution. Um, Adriana B. Uh, Johan R. Uh, Bonnie M. Claire, Joey H, Violet M, Matt R, Gemma LT, Rebecca W, Catherine L, Natalie S, Sarah R, and Hayden W. And thank you as well to all of our existing patrons as well. Your, your ongoing support means so, so much to everyone. Um, and we hope you keep enjoying the shows. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Sarah. So we are about to start the second half of Henry VI Part 3 in just uh, a couple of seconds time. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the rest of the show. However, if you've liked it so far, please do like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And of course, as always, uh, tweet at Sir Pat Stew to let him know what we've going on here. We'd love to have him. I'm sure you'd love to see him. So let's just keep letting him know about what we're doing. Thank you so much. And without further ado, it is my great pleasure to return to Henry the Sixth, Part Three. Act Four, Scene One. London, a palace room. Enter Richard of Gloucester, Clarence, Somerset, and Montague. Now, tell me, Brother Clarence, what think you of this new marriage with Lady Grey? Have not our brother made a worthy choice? Alas, you know, tis far hence from France. And how could he stay till Warwick made return? My lords, forbear this talk. Here comes the king. And his well-chosen bride. I mind to tell him plainly what I think. Now, Brother Clarence, how like you our choice that you stand pensive as half malcontent. As well as Louis of France or the Earl of Warwick, which are so weak of courage and in judgment that they'll take no offense at our abuse. Suppose they take offense without a cause. They are but Louis and Warwick. I am Edward, your king and Warwick's, and must have my will. And shall have your will because our king, yet hasty marriage seldom proveth well. Nay, brother Richard, are you offended too? Not I. No, God forbid that I should wish them severed whom God have joined together. I, and twere pity to sunder them that yoke so well together. Setting your scorns and your mislike aside, tell me some reason why the Lady Grey should not become my wife and England's queen. Then this is mine opinion, that King Louis becomes your enemy for mocking him about the marriage of the Lady Bona. And Warwick, doing what you gave in charge, is now dishonoured by this new marriage. 
what if both Louis and Warwick be appeased by some invention as I can devise? Yet to have joined with France in such alliance would more have strengthened this our commonwealth against foreign storms than any homebred marriage. Why, knows not Montague that of itself England is safe if true within itself? But the safer when tis backed with France. Is better using France than trusting France. For this one speech, Lord Hastings, well deserves to have the heir of the Lord Hungerford. I would of that. It was my will and grant, and for this once my will shall stand for law. And yet, methinks, your grace, have not done well to give the heir and daughter of Lord Scales unto the brother of your loving bride. She better would have fitted me or Clarence, but in your bride you bury brotherhood. Or else you would not have bestowed the heir of the Lord Bonville on your new wife's son and leave your brothers to go speed elsewhere. Alas, poor Clarence, is it for a wife that thou art malcontent? I will provide thee. In choosing for yourself, you showed your judgment, which being shallow, you shall give me leave to play the booker in my own behalf. And to that end, I shortly mind to leave you. Leave me or tarry, Edward will be king and not be tied unto his brother's will. My lords, before it please his majesty to raise my state of title to a queen, do me but right, and you must all confess that I was not ignoble of descent, and meaner than myself have had like fortune. But as this title honors me and mine, so your dislikes to whom I would be pleasing doth cloud my joys with danger and with sorrow. My love, forbear to fawn upon their frowns. What danger or sorrow can befall thee, so long as Edward is thy constant friend and true sovereign whom they must obey? I hear, yet say not much, but think the more. Now, messenger, what letters or what news from France? Uh, my sovereign leads no letters and few words, but such as I, without your special pardon, dare not relate. Go to, we pardon thee. Therefore, in brief, tell me their words as near as thou canst guess them. What answer makes King Louis unto our Lord? At, at my depart... At my depart, these were his very words. Go tell false Edward, the supposed king, that Louis of France is sending over maskers to revel it with him and his new bride. Is Louis so bra brave? Belikes he thinks me Henry. But what said Warwick to these injuries? Uh, he, more incensed against your majesty than all the rest, discharged me with these words. Tell him from me that he hath done me wrong, and therefore I'll uncrown him ere it be long. But say, is Warwick friends with Margaret? I, gracious sovereign, they are so linked in friendship that young Prince Edward marries Warwick's daughter. You like the elder, Clarence, you'll have the younger. You like the elder, Clarence, we'll have the younger. Now, brother king, farewell and sit you fast, for I will hence to Warwick's other daughter, that though I want a kingdom, yet in marriage I may not prove inferior to yourself. You that love me in Warwick, follow me. Not I. My thoughts aim at a further matter. I stay not for the love of Edward, but the crown. Pembroke and Stafford, you in our behalf go levy men and make prepare for war. They are already, or quickly be landed, myself in person will straight to follow you. But ere I go, Hastings and Montague, resolve my doubt. You twain of all the rest are near to Warwick by blood and alliance. Tell me, if you love Warwick more than me, if it be so, then both depart to him. I'd rather wish you foes than hollow friends. But if you mind to hold your true obedience, give me assurance with some friendly vow that I may never have you in suspect. So God help Montague as he proves true. And Hastings as he favors Edward's cause. Now, Brother Richard, will you stand by us? Aye, in despite of all that shall withstand you. Why so? Then I am sure of victory. Therefore, let us hence and lose no hour till we, till we meet Warwick with his foreign power. Exeunt. Act four, scene two. A plain in Warwickshire. Enter Warwick and Oxford in England with French soldiers. 
Trust me, my lord, all hitherto goes well. The common people by numbers swarm to us. But see where Somerset and Clarence comes. Speak suddenly, my lords. Are we all friends? Fear not that, my lord. Then, gentle Clarence, welcome unto Warwick, and welcome Somerset. I hold it cowardice to rest mistrustful where a noble heart hath pawned an open hand in sign of love. Else might I think that Clarence, Edward's brother, were but a feigned friend to our proceedings. But welcome, sweet Clarence, my daughter shall be thine. And now, what rests but in night's coverture, thy brother being carelessly encamped, his soldiers lurking in the town about, are but attended by a simple guard. We may surprise and take him at our pleasure. Our scouts have found the adventure very easy. So we, well covered with the knight's black mantle, at unawares may beat down Edward's guard and seize himself. I say not slaughter him, for I intend but only to surprise him. You that will follow me to this attempt, applaud the name of Henry with your leader. Henry! 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 Then let's on our way. Henry! Sort for Warwick and his friends, God and St. George. Exeunt. Act four, scene three. Edward's camp near Warwick. Enter three watchmen to guard the king's tent. Come on, my masters. Each man take his stand. The king by this is setting down to sleep. Would will he not to bow? Why, no, for he hath made a solemn vow never to die and take his natural rest till Warwick or himself be quite suppressed. Well, tomorrow then belike shall be the day, if Warwick be so near as men report. But say, I pray, what noble man is that, that with the king he arrested in his tent? Tis the Lord Hastings, the king's chiefest friend. Oh, is it so? But why commands the king that his chief followers lodge in towns about him, whilst he himself keeps in the cold field? Now, there's the more honour, because more dangerous. Aye, but give me worship and quietness. I like it better than a dangerous honour. There is his tent, and see where stand his guard. Courage, my masters, honour now or never. But follow me, and Edward shall be ours. Who can stay? Stay, although thou'st. Arm! 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 What are they that fly there? Richard and Hastings, let them go. Here is hey. the Duke. Why, Warwick, when we parted, thou didst call me king. Aye, but the case is altered. When you disgraced <clears throat> me in my embassade, then I degraded you from being king, and now come to create you Duke of York. Alas, how should you govern any kingdom, thou not know how to use ambassadors? nor how to be contented with one wife, nor how to use your brothers brotherly, nor how to study for the people's welfare, nor how to shroud yourself from enemies. Nay, brother of Clarence, art thou here too? Nay, then I see that Edward's needs must down. Yet Warwick, despite all a mischance of thee thyself and all thy complices, Edward will always bear himself as king. Though fortune's palace overthrow my state, my mind exceeds the compass of her wheel. Then for his mind be Edward England's king. <laughs> but Henry now shall wear the English crown and be true king indeed, thou but the shadow. My Lord of Somerset, at my request, see that forthwith Duke Edward be conveyed unto my brother. Archbishop of York. What fates impose that men must need abide, it boots not to resist both wind and tide. What now remains, my lords, for us to do, but march to London with our soldiers. 
I, that's the first thing that we have to do, to free King Henry from imprisonment and see him seated in the regal throne. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 4. London, a palace room. Enter Rivers and Lady Grey, now Queen Elizabeth. Madam, what makes you in this sudden change? Why, Brother Rivers, are you yet to learn what late misfortunes has befallen King Edward? What, loss of some pitched battle against Warwick? No, but the loss of his own royal person. Then is my sovereign slain? I almost slain, for he is taken prisoner, either betrayed by falsehood of his guard or by his foe's surprise at unawares, and as I further have to understand, is new committed to the Bishop of York, fell Warwick's brother, and by that our foe. With these news I must confess are full of grief, yet, gracious madam, Bear it as you may, Warwick may lose that now hath won the day. Till then fair hope must hinder lives decay, and either rather wane me from despair for love of Edward's offspring in my womb. This is it that makes me bridal passion and bear with mildness my misfortunes cross. I, I, for this I draw in many a tear and stop the rising of blood-sucking sighs, lest with my sighs or tears I blast or drown King Edward's fruit, true heir to the English crown. But, madam, where is Warwick then become? I am informed that he comes towards London to set the crown once more on Henry's head. Guess thou the rest. King Edward's friends must down. But to prevent the tyrant's violence, for trust not him that hath once broken faith, I'll henceforth with unto the sanctuary. To save at least the heir of Edward's right, there shall I rest, secure from force and fraud. Come, therefore let us fly, while we may fly. If Warwick takes us, we are sure to die. Exeunt, Act 4, Scene 5, Yorkshire, a park near Middleham Castle. Enter Richard of Gloucester, Lord Hastings, and Sir William Stanley. Now, my Lord Hastings and Sir William Stanley, leave off to wonder why I drew you hither into this chiefless thicket of the park. Thus stands the case. You know our king, my brother, is prisoner to the bishop here at whose hands he hath good usage and great liberty, and often but attended with weak guard, comes hunting this way to disport himself. I have advertised him by secret means that if about this hour he make this way under the colour of his usual game, he shall here find his friends with horse and men to set him free from his captivity. This way, my lord, for this way lies the game. Nay, this way, man, see where the huntsmen stand. Now, brother of Gloucester, lords Hastings and the rest, stand you thus close to seal my the bishop's deer? Brother, the time and case requires haste. Your horse stands ready at the park corner. Well, whither shall we then? To Lynn, my lord, and shipped from thence to Flanders. Well guessed, believe me, for that was my meaning. Stanley, I will requite thy forwardness. But wherefore stay we? Tis no time to talk. Huntsman, what sayest thou? Wilt thou go along? Better to do so than tarry and be hanged. Come then, away. Let's do how no more or do. Bishop, farewell. Shield thee from Warwick's frown and pray that I may repossess the crown. Exeunt. Act 4, Scene 6. London, the Tower. Enter King Henry VI, Clarence, Warwick, Somerset, young Henry Richmond, Oxford, Montague, and Lieutenant of the Tower. Master Lieutenant, now that God and friends have shaken Edward from the regal seat and turned my captive states to liberty, my fear to hope, my sorrows unto joys. At our enlargement, what are thy due fees? Objects may challenge nothing of their sovereigns, but if an humble prayer may prevail, I then crave pardon of your majesty. For what, lieutenant, for well using me? Nay, be thou sure I well requite thy kindness, for that it made my imprisonment a pleasure. But, Warwick, after God thou setst me free. And chiefly, therefore, I thank God and thee. He was the author, thou the instrument. Therefore, that I may conquer fortune's spite by living low where fortune cannot hurt me, and that the people of this blessed land may not be punished with my thwarting stars. Warwick, although my head still wear the crown, I here resign my government to thee, for thou art fortunate in all thy deeds. 
Your grace hath still been famed for virtuous, and now may seem as wise as virtuous, by spying and avoiding fortune's malice, for few men rightly temper with the stars. Yet in this one thing let me blame your grace, for choosing me when Clarence is in place. No, Warwick, thou art worthy of the sway, and therefore I yield thee my free consent. And I choose Clarence only for protector. Warwick and Clarence, give me both your hands. Now join your hands. And with your hands, your hearts, that no dissension hinder government, I make you both protectors of this land. What answers Clarence to his sovereign's will? That he consents, if Warwick yield consent, for on thy fortune I repose myself. Why then, though loath, yet I must be content. We'll yoke together like a double shadow to Henry's body and supply his place. And Clarence, now then, it is more than needful forthwith that Edward be pronounced a traitor and all his lands and goods confiscate. What else? And that succession be determined. Aye, therein Clarence shall not want his part. But with the first of all your chief affairs, let me entreat, for I command no more, that Margaret, your queen, and my son Edward be sent for to return from France with speed. For till I see them here, my, by doubtful fear, my joy of liberty is half eclipsed. It shall be done, my sovereign, with all speed. My lord of Somerset, what youth is that of whom you seem to have so tender care? My liege, it is young Henry, Earl of Richmond. Come hither, England's hope. If secret powers suggest but truth to my divining thoughts, this pretty lad will prove our country's bliss. Make much of him, my lords, for this is he, must help you more than you are hurt by me. What news, my friend? Oh, 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 that Edward is escaped from your brother and fled to Burgundy. Oh, unsavory news. But how made he escape? He was conveyed by Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and the Lord Hastings, who attended him in secret ambush on the forest side. Oh, my brother was too careless of his charge. Let us hence my sovereign to provide a salve for any sore that may betide. My lord, I like not of this flight of Edwards, for doubtless Burgundy will yield him help, and we shall have more wars for before it be long. As Henry's late presaging prophecy did glad my heart with hope of this young Richmond, so doth my heart misgive me in these conflicts what may befall him to his harm and ours. Therefore, Lord Oxford, to prevent the worst, forthwith we'll send him hence to Brittany till storms be passed of civil enmity. Aye, for if Edward repossesses the crown, tis like that rich man with the rest shall down. It shall be so, he shall to Brittany. Come, therefore, let's about it speedily. Exeunt. Act 4, scene 7, before York. Enter King Edward, Richard of Gloucester, Hastings and soldiers, a troop of Hollanders. Now, Brother Richard, Lord Hastings and the rest, yet thus far fortune makes, maketh us amends, and says once more I shall interchange my wane state for Henry's regal crown. Well, we have passed and now repassed the seas and bought desired help from Burgundy. What then remains before the gates of York but that we enter into us as their dukedom? The gates meet fast? Brother, I like not this, for many men that stumble at the threshold are well foretold that danger lurks within. Tush, man, abodements must now affright us. My liege, I'll knock once more to summon them. Oh, my lord! We were forewarned of your coming, and shut the gates for safety of ourselves, for now we owe allegiance unto Henry. Master Mayor, if Henry be your king, let Edward at the least is Duke of York. True, my good lord, I know you for no less. Why, and I challenge nothing but my dukedom, as being well content with that alone. 
Why, Master Mayor, why stand you in a doubt? Open the gates. We are King Henry's friends. I say you so. The gates shall then be opened. The good old man would fain that all were well. So it were not long of him. But being entered, I doubt not I, but we shall soon persuade both him and all his brothers unto reason. So, Master Mayor, these gates may not, must not be shut, but in the night or in the time of war, what fear not, man, but yield me up the keys. For Edward shall defend the town and thee, and with all friends that deign to follow me. <laughs> Brother, this is Sir John Gun Montgomery and our trusty friend, unless I be deceived. Welcome, Sir John, but why come you in arms? To help King Edward in his time of storm, as every loyal subject ought to do. Thanks, good Montgomery, but now we forget our title to the crown and only claim our dukedom till God please to send the rest. Then fare you well, for I will hence again. I came to serve a king and not a duke. Drummer, strike up and let us march away. Sir John, a while, and we'll debate by what safe means the crown may be recovered. Talk you of debating. In few words, why shall we fight if you pretend no title? Why, brother, wherefore stand you on nice points? When we grow stronger, then we'll make our claim. Till then, tis wisdom to conceal our meaning. Away with scrupulous wit. Now arms must rule. And fearless minds climb soonest onto crowns. Brother, we will proclaim you out of hand. The bruit thereof will bring you many friends. Then be it as you will, for tis my right. But Henry but per usurps the diadem. Ay, now my sovereign speaketh like himself, and now will I be Edward's champion. Sound trumpet. Edward shall be here proclaimed. Come, fellow soldier, make thou proclamation. <laughs> Before, by the grace of God, King of England and Lord of Ireland, etc. And whosoever gainsay King Edward's right by this challenge, I challenge him to a single fight. <laughs> thanks, brave Montgomery, and thanks to you all. If fortune serve me, I'll requite this kindness. Now for the night, let's harbor here in York, and when the morning sun shall rise his car above the border of this horizon, we'll forward towards Warwick and his mates. Come on, brave soldiers, doubt not of the day, and that once gotten, doubt not of large pay. Exit. Act four, scene eight. London, a palace room. Enter King Henry, Warwick, Montague, Clarence, Oxford, and Exeter. What council, lords, Edward from Belgia, with hasty Germans and blunt Hollanders, hath passed in safety through the narrow seas, and with his troops doth march amain to London, and many giddy people flock to him? Let's levy men and beat him back again. The little fire is quickly trodden out, which being suffered, rivers cannot quench. In Warwickshire I have many true-hearted friends, those will I muster up. And thou, son Clarence, shalt stir up in Suffolk, Norfolk, and in Kent, the knights and gentlemen to come with thee. Thou, brother Montague, in Buckingham, Northampton, and in Leicestershire, shalt find men well inclined to hear what thou commandst. And thou, brave Oxford, wondrous well-beloved, in Oxfordshire shalt muster up thy friends. My sovereign with the loving citizens, like to his island, girt in with the ocean, shall rest in London till we come to him. Fair lords, take leave and stand not to reply. Farewell, my sovereign. Farewell, my Hector and my Troy's true hope. In sign of truth, I kiss your highness's hand. Well-minded Clarence, be thou fortunate. Comfort, my lord, and so I take my leave. And thus, I see you my truth, and bid adieu. Sweet Oxford, and my loving Montague, all at once, once more a happy farewell. 
Farewell, sweet lords. Let's meet at Coventry. Here at the palace will I rest a while. Cousin of Exeter, what thinks your lordship? I have not stopped mine ears to their demands. I have not been desirous of their wealth. Then why should they love Edward more than me? A Lancaster, a Lancaster, a Lancaster, a Lancaster. Hark, hark, my lord, what shouts are this? Seize on the shamefaced Henry, bear him hence, and once again claim us King of England. Hence with him to the tower, let him not speak. And lords, towards Coventry, bend we our course, where peremptory Warwick now remains. The sun shines hot, and if we use delay, cold biting winter of Mars, our hope for hay. Away be times before his forces join, and take the great grown traitor unawares. Brave warriors, march amain towards Coventry. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 1. Coventry. Enter Warwick, the mayor of Coventry, two messengers and others upon the walls. Where is the post that came from valiant Oxford? How far hence is thy lord, mine honest fellow? By this of Dunmore, marching hitherward. How far off is our brother Montague? Where is the post that came from Montague? By this at Daintree with a puissant troop. Say, Somerville, what says my loving son? And by thy guess, how nigh is Clarence now? At Southern, I did leave him with his forces and to expect him here some two hours hence. Then Clarence is at hand. I hear his drum. It is not his, my lord, here Southern lies. The drum your honour hears marcheth from Warwick. Who should that be? Belike unlooked for friends. They are at hand, and you shall quickly know. <laughs> Sound of parley. See how the surly Warwick mans the wall. Oh, unbid spite is sportful, Edward, come. Where slipped our scouts, or how are they seduced that we could hear no news of his repair? Now, Warwick, wilt thou ope the city gates? Speak gentle words and humbly bend thy knee. Call Edward king, and at his hands beg mercy, and he shall pardon thee these outrages. Nay, rather, wilt thou draw thy forces hence? Confess who set thee up and plucked thee down? Call Warwick patron and be penitent, and thou shalt still remain the Duke of York. I thought at least he would have said king, or did he make the jest against his will? Is not a dukedom, sir, a goodly gift? Aye, by my faith, for a poor oil to give, I'll do thee service for so good a gift. Twas I that gave the kingdom to thy brother. Why then tis mine, if but by Warwick's gift? Thou art no Atlas for so great a weight, and weakling, Warwick takes his gift again, and Henry is my king, Warwick his subject. But Warwick's king is Edward's prisoner, and gallant Warwick, do but answer this. What is the body when the head is off? You left poor Henry at the bishop's palace, and ten to one you'll meet him in the tower. Tis even so, yet you are Warwick still. Come, Warwick, take the time, kneel down, kneel down. Nay, when? Strike now, or else the iron cools. I had rather chop this hand off at a blow, and with the other fling it at thy face, than bear so low a sail to strike to thee. Sail how thou canst, have wind and tide, thy friend. This hand, fast wound by the cold black hair, shall, whilst thy head is warm and new cut off, write in the dust this sentence with thy blood. Wind changing Warwick now can change no more. Oh, cheerful colours, see where Oxford comes. Oxford, Oxford, for Lancaster! The gates are open, let us enter too. Though other foes may set upon our backs, stand we in good array? For they no doubt will issue out again and bid us battle. If not, the city being of small defence will quickly rouse the traitors in the same. Oh, welcome, Oxford, for we want thy help. Thou and thy brother both shall buy this treason, even with the dearest blood your bodies bear. The harder match, the greater victory. My mind presageth a happy and gain and conquest. Oh, 
Somerset, Somerset for Lancaster. Two of thy name, both Dukes of Somerset, have sold their lives unto the house of York, and thou shalt be the third, and with this sword hold. And lo, where George of Clarence sweeps along, of force enough to bid his brother battle, with whom an upright zeal to right prevails more than the nature of a brother's love. Come, Clarence, come, thou wilt, if Warwick call. Father of Warwick, know you what this means? Look here, I throw my infamy at thee. I will not ruinate my father's house who gave his blood to lime the stones together and set up Lancaster. Why trowest thou, Warwick, that Clarence is so harsh, so blunt, unnatural to bend the fatal instruments of war against his brother and his lawful king? I am so sorry for my trespass made, but to deserve well at my brother's hands I here proclaim myself thy mortal foe with resolution wheresoever I meet thee, as I will meet thee if thou stir abroad, to plague thee for thy foul misleading me. And so, proud hearted Warwick, I defy thee, and to my brother turn my blushing cheeks. Pardon me, Edward. I will make amends. A and Richard. Do not frown upon my faults, for I will henceforth be no more unconstant. Now welcome more and ten times more beloved than if thou never deserved our hate. Welcome, good Clarence. This is brother-like. Oh, passing traitor, perjured and unjust. What, Warwick, wilt thou leave the town and fight, or shall we beat the stones about thine ears? Oh, alas, I am not cooped here for defense. I will away towards Barnet presently, and bid thee battle, Edward, if thou darest. Yes, Warwick, Edward darest, and leads the way. Lords, to the field, St. George, and victory! Exeunt King Edward and his company. March, Warwick, and his company follows. Act 5, Scene 2, a battlefield near Barnet. Enter King Edward, bringing forth Warwick, wounded. <laughs> die thou there, die thou and die our fear. For Warwick was a bug that feared us all. Now, Montague, sit fast that I seek for thee, that Warwick bones may keep thine company. <laughs> Oh, is nigh. Come to me, friend or foe, and tell me who is Victor, York, or Warwick. Oh, oh, I ask my that. My mangled body shows my blood, my want of strength, my sick heart shows that I must yield my body to the earth and by my fall, the conquest to my foe. <sighs> the wrinkles in my brows, now filled with blood, were likened off to kingly sepulchres. For who lived king but I could dig his grave? And who durst smile when Warwick bent his brow? Lo, now my glory smeared with dust and blood. My works, my parks, my manners that I had even now forsake me and of all my lands is nothing left me but my body's length. Why, what is pomp, rule, reign but earth? and dust, and live we how we can, yet die we must. <laughs> oh. 
Warwick, Warwick, where thou as we are, we might recover all our loss again. Uh, why, then I would not fly. Uh, uh, Montague, if thou be there, sweet brother, take, take my hand. Come quickly, Montague, or I am dead. Ah, Warwick, Montague hath breathed his last, and to the latest gasp cried out for Warwick and said, Comment me to my valiant brother. Sweet, rest his soul. Fly, lords, and save yourselves. For Warwick bids you all farewell to meet. In heaven. Away, away, to meet the Queen's great power. Exeunt, Act 5, Scene 3. Another part of the battlefield near Barnet. Enter King Edward in triumph with Richard of Gloucester, Clarence, and the rest. <laughs> Far our fortune keeps an upward course, and we are graced with wreaths of victory. But in the midst of this bright shining day, I spy a black suspicious threatening cloud that will encounter with our glorious sun ere he attain his easeful western bed. A little gale will soon disperse that cloud and blow it to the source from whence it came. Thy very beams will dry those vapors up, for every cloud engenders not a storm. The queen is valued 30,000 strong, and Somerset with Oxford fled to her. If she have time to breathe, be well assured her faction will be full as strong as ours. We are advertised by our loving friends. They do hold course near Tewkesbury. We, having now the best at Barnet Field, will thither straight for willingness rids way. As we march, our strength will be augmented in every country as we go along. Strike up the drum, cry courage and away. <laughs> Five, scene four, Plains near Tewkesbury. Enter Queen Margaret, young Prince Edward, Somerset, Oxford, and soldiers. Great lords, wise men never sit and wail their loss, but cheerly seek how to redress their harms. What thou, the mast be now blown overboard, the cable broke and the holding anchor lost, and half our sailors swallowed in the flood. Yet lives our pilot still. It's meet that he should leave the helm and like a fearful lad with tearful eyes add water to the sea and give more strength to that which hath too much, whilst in his moan the ship splits on the rock, which industry and courage might have saved. Ah, oh, what a shame. Ah, oh, what a fault were this. We will not from the helm to sit and weep, but keep our cause, though the rough winds say no, from shelves and rocks that threaten us with rack. As good to shine the waves as speak them fair. And what is Edward but a ruthless sea? What Clarence but a quicksand of deceit, and Richard but a ragged fatal rock, all these the enemies to our poor bark. Say, you can swim, alas, tis but a while, tread on the sand, but there you quickly sink. Bestride the rock, the tide will wash you off or else you famish. That's a threefold death. This I, Lord, speak to let you understand if case someone of you should would fly from us, that there's no hope for mercy with the brothers more than with ruthless waves with sand and rocks. Why courage then? What cannot be avoided to a childish weakness to lament or fear? Methinks a woman of this valiant spirit should, if a coward heard her speak these words, infuse his breast with magnanimity and make him naked, foil a man at arms. Woman and children of so high a courage and warriors faint. Why? To perpetual shame. O brave young prince, thy famous grandfather doth live again in thee. Long mayst thou live to bear his image and renew his glories. 
And he that will not fight for such a hope, go home to bed, and like the owl by day, if your eyes be mocked and wondered at. Thanks, gentle Somerset, sweet Oxford, thanks. And take his thanks that yet hath nothing else. Prepare your lords, for Edward is at hand. Rather the fight, therefore, be resolute. I thought no less. It is his policy to haste that fast, to find us unprovided. But he's deceived. We are in readiness. For this cheers my heart to see your forwardness. Here pitch our battle, hence we will not budge. <laughs> Followers, yonder stands the thorny wood, which by the heaven's assistance and your strength must by the roots be hewn up ere night. Give signal to the fight and to it, lords. Lords, knights, and gentlemen, what I would say, my tears can say, for every word I speak, ye see I drink the water of my eye. Therefore, no more but this. Henry, your sovereign, is prisoner to the foe. His state usurped, his realm slaughterhouse, his subjects slain, his statues cancelled, and his treasures spent. And yonder is the wolf that makes this spoil. You fight in justice, then in God's name, lords, be valiant and give signal to the fight. Retreat. <sighs> his followers flies. The chambers be discharged. Retreat! Then enter King Edward, Clarence, and Gloucester, and the rest of the king's followers, and make a great shout and cry for York, for York, for York. Queen Margaret is taken, and Prince Edward, and Oxford, and Somerset. Take him away! <laughs> the Queen is taken! The Queen is taken! <laughs> Take them away! Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 5. Another part of the battlefield near Barnet. Enter King Edward, Richard of Gloucester, with Queen Margaret, prisoner, Clarence, and soldiers with Oxford and Somerset, prisoners. Now here a period of tumultuous broils. Away with Oxford to Ames Castle straight, for Somerset, off with his guilty head. Go bear them hence, I will not hear them speak. On my part, I will not trouble thee with words. Nor I, but stoop with patience to my fortune. So we part sadly in this troublous world to meet with joy in sweet Jerusalem. Is proclamation made that who finds Edward shall have a high reward and he his life? It is, and lo, where youthful Edward comes. Bring forth the gallant, let us hear him speak. What, can so young a thorn begin to prick? Speak like a subject, proud, ambitious York. Suppose that I am now my father's mouth. Resign thy chair, and where I stand, kneel thou. I that thy father had been so resolved. That you might still have worn the petticoat, and ne'er have stolen the breach from Lancaster. Let Aesop fable in a winter's night. His curious riddle sorts not with this place. By heaven, brat, I'll plague ye for that word. Ay, thou wast born to be a plague to men. For God's sake, take away this captive scold. Nay, take away this scold and crook back, rather. Peace, willful boy, or I will charm your tongue. Untutored lad, thou art too malapert. I know my duty. You are all undutiful, lascivious Edward, and thou perjured George, and thou misshapen Dick. I tell ye all, I am your better. Treat us as ye are, and thou usurpst my father's right and mine. Take that, the likeness of this railer here. 
Fallest thou? Take that to end thy agony. <laughs> Years for twitting me with perjury. I do. Marry and shall. Hold, Richard, hold, for we have done too much. Why should she live to fill the world with words? What? D does she swoon? Use means for her recovery. Clarence, excuse me to the king, my brother. I'll hence to London on a serious matter. Ere you come there, be sure to hear some news. What? The tower. The tower. Oh, speak then, Ned. Speak, thy mother. Boy, oh, can I not speak? Oh, traitors and murderers. He was a man, this in respect to child, and men never spend their fury on a child. Oh, what worse than murder, that I may name it. No, no, my heart will burst, and if I speak, and I will speak, that's so my heart will burst. Butchers and villains, bloody cannibals. Sweet of lunch, have you untimely cropped? You have no children, butchers. You, if you had the thought of them, would have stirred up remorse. Oh, but if you ever had a chance to have a child, look in his youth to have him cut off as death men, you have rid the sweet young prince. Away with her, go bear her hence perforce. Nay, never bear me hence, dispatch me here. Here sheath thy sword, I'll pardon thee my death. What, will thou not? Then Clarence, do it now. By heaven, I will not deed thee so much ease. Good Clarence, do, sweet Clarence, do thou do it. Didst thou not hear me swear I would not do it? Aye, but thou usest to swear thyself. Twas sin before, and now tis charity. Why wilt thou not? Where is that devil's butcher, hard painted Richard? Richard, where art thou? Thou art not here. Murder in thy arms, deed, petitioners for blood thou never puts back. Away, I say, I charge thee, bear her hence. So come to you and yours as to this prince. <sighs> Where's Richard gone? To London, in all post, and as I guess, to make a bloody supper in the tower. He's sudden, if a thing comes to his head. Now march we hence, discharge the common sort with pay and thanks, and let's away to London and see how our gentle queen fares. By this, I hope she hath a son for me. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 6. London, the Tower. Enter Henry VI and Richard of Gloucester on the walls. Good day, my lord. What, set your book so hard? Aye, my good lord. My lord, I should say rather. Tis sin to flatter. Good was little better. Good Gloucester and good devil were alike, and both preposterous, therefore not good lord. So flies the reckless shepherd from the wolf. So first the harmless sheep doth yield his fleece, and next his throat to the butcher's knife. What scene of death hath Roscius now to act? Suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. The thief doth fear each bush an officer. The bird that hath been limed in a bush, with trembling wings misdoubteth every bush. But wherefore dost thou come? Is it for my life? Thinks thou I am an executioner? A persecutor, I'm sure thou art. If murdering innocence be executing, why then thou art an executioner? Thy son I killed for this presumption. Hadst thou been killed when first thou didst presume, thou hadst not lived to kill a son of mine. And thus I prophesy. That many a thousand, which now mistrust no parcel of my fear, shall rue the hour that ever thou wast born. The owl shrieked at thy birth, an evil sign, 
the raven rooked her on the chimney's top, and chattering pies in dismal discord sung. Thy mother felt more than a mother's pain, and yet brought forth less than a mother's hope, to wit an indigested and deformed lump, not like the fruit of such a goodly tree. Teeth hadst thou in thy head when thou wast born, to signify thou camest to bite the world, and if the rest be true which I have heard, thou camest. I hear no more. Die, prophet, in thy speech. <laughs> For this, amongst the rest, was I ordained. I am for much more slaughter after this. Oh, God, forgive my sins. Oh, pardon me. What? Will the aspiring blood of Lancaster sink in the ground? I thought it would have mounted. See how my sword weeps for the poor king's death. Oh, Mason, much purple tears be always shed from those that wish the downfall of our house. If any spark of life yet be remaining, down, down to hell and say, I sent thee thither. I that have neither pity, love, nor fear. Indeed, tis true that Henry told me of. For I have often heard my mother say, I came into the world with my legs forward. Had I not reason, think ye, to make haste and seek their ruin that obsuped our right? The midwife wondered, and women cried, Oh, Jesus, bless us, he is born with teeth! And so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. <laughs> then since the heavens have shaped my body so, let hell make crooked my mind to answer it. I have no brother. I am like no brother. And this word love, which greybeards call divine, be resident in men like one another and not in me. I am myself alone. Clarence, beware. Thou keep'st me from the light, but I will sort a pitchy day for thee. For I will buzz abroad such prophecies that Edward shall be fearful of his life. And then to purge his fear, I'll be thy death. <laughs> King Henry and the prince, his son, are gone. Clarence, thy turn is next, and then the rest, counting myself but bad, and I be best. I'll throw thy body in another room. And triumph, Henry, in thy day of doom. Exit with the body. Act 5, scene 7. London, a room in the palace. Enter King Edward, Queen Elizabeth, Clarence, Richard of Gloucester, Hastings, nurse with the young prince, and attendants. <laughs> Once more we sit in England's royal throne, repurchased with the blood of enemies. What valiant foemen like to autumn's corn have we mowed down in tops of all their pride? Three dukes of Somerset, threefold renowned for hardy and undoubted champions. Two Cliffords, as in father and the son, and two Northumberlands. Two braver men there spurred their courses at the trumpet's sound. With them, the two brave bears, Warwick and Montague, that in their claims fettered the kingly lion and made the forest tremble when they roared. Thus have we swept suspicion from our seat and made our footstool of security. Come hither, Bess, and let me kiss my boy. Oh, young Ned, for thee, thine uncles and myself have in rumors watched the winter's night and all afoot in summer scalding heat that though thou mightest repossess the crown in peace and all our labors, thou shalt reap the gain. I'll blast his harvest and your head were laid, for yet I am not looked on in the world. Clarence and Gloucester, love my lovely queen and kiss your princely nephew, brothers both. The duty that I owe unto my majesty, I seal upon the lips of this sweet babe. Thanks, noble Clarence, worthy brother. Thanks. 
and that I love the tree from whence thou sprangst. Witness the loving kiss I give the fruit. To say the truth, so Judas kissed his master and cried all hell, and as he meant all harm. Now am I seated as my soul delights, having my country's peace and brother's loves. What will your grace have done with Margaret? Uh, Rainier, her father to the king of France, hath palmed the Sicils and Jerusalem, and hither have they sent her for her ransom. Away with her and waft her hence to France. And now what rests that we spend the time with stately triumphs, mirthful comic shows such as befits the pleasure of the court. Sound drums and trumpets, farewell sour annoy, for here I hope begins our lasting joy. Exeunt omnes. And ladies and gentlemen, here endeth Henry the Sixth, Part Three, and by extension, the Henry the Sixth trilogy. Actors, please come back on, take your curtain calls, give yourselves a massive round of applause, wipe your faces, <laughs> change your tops, get out of all that sticky jam business. Incredible, incredible. Well done, everyone. Extraordinary work, extraordinary work. <laughs> And uh, I'd just like to give a massive shout out, first of all, uh, to Richard Hand on Soundscaping uh, for an incredible job uh, turning that around in no time at all and was probably one of the most uh, advanced and immersive and ambitious soundtracks that we've had and our audience have noticed and appreciated it. So thank you so much, mate. And obviously to our valiant swings, uh, Julia stepping in there a couple of times. Well done, mate. Well done. It's why we're there, it's why we're there. And uh, Clay as well, thank you so much for being there, man, on tenter hooks throughout. Really appreciate it. Fabulous, fabulous job. So we have about a 10 second delay between us and the audience, so they'll probably just now be seeing the end of the play, uh, but we'll uh, be getting our uh, kind of reactions from them. We'll be sharing them with you, and we'll also be answering some more audience questions as well. Uh, and uh, good job to uh, Ali and to Lindsay and to uh, anyone else that I can spy a glass of wine in their hands. No one deserves it more right now, so absolutely. <laughs> celebrate, celebrate. <laughs> This is where the party starts. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, amazing. Oh, well guys, I've, I've got um, a couple of questions from earlier that we didn't get to that I'll bring back and then we'll see if there's any new ones in the chat. Lots of applause coming through. So thank you everyone watching. Uh, it's a fab fabulous to, to see and to chat with you. Um, so let me see, I've got one here, which actually was um, for King Henry. Um, that we didn't get to earlier. Uh, so the question is, um, what your thoughts are on why Henry doesn't want to be king, but he's made such a big deal about being king, but then not passing the crown onto his sons. So what what do you think he's really hoping to accomplish? By this? I think because he sees uh, having the crown as his birthright, and this obviously takes place during a time period when uh, people believe in the divine right of kings. He's been raised by churchmen, and so he really believes in that sense of divinity. But I think the the pressures of the the job being quite a quite a peaceful, non warmongering man during a time when everyone values uh, battle hardiness and uh, prowess on the battlefield. He's, he's just a a man out of time. He's and so so while he believes it's he should he should be very much be having the crown because it's his right and it's the it's the right of it's the will of God in, in, from his perspective. Uh, he takes no joy in the actual responsibilities and the the weight and the pressure that comes with it. So it's there's there's a embrace the contradiction. There's contrary elements. He should he should be king because it's right, but he doesn't enjoy the job. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, David. That's so fascinating. I hope it was um, eligible. <laughs> yes. It definitely was. It definitely was. Yes. Absolutely. Cool. Yes. I love the idea of him being the right king at the wrong time. I think uh, there's something really poignant about that. So um, I've got um, oh um, another one here, which um, is again for everyone. So what have people learned about Shakespeare through this process? 
Has anything new come up? And I've, I think not, I've not done Shakespeare before via Zoom, so that's been a real <laughs> lecture. <laughs> um, it's been really good to sort of um, test your muscles with following the script and your, um, you know, and your the way the, the language with uh, and because you can't really look at everybody at once. Um, so it's been a real a real challenge in that sense. Um, but yeah, it's. I mean, I, again, I haven't had a, done the histories before, so the the language with it's been just really great to sort of um, experiment with. I don't know what everyone else thought. Yeah, and that's for me, um, I, I have limited knowledge on any Shakespeare stuff at all. So I was like Googling really hard on English history, you know, what happened with the, from, the French people? Like what's wrong with you guys to keep fighting with each other? But it was an amazing process to uh, learn more about history. And on that, it's really joyous because it gets better the more you read or watch. This is like, this is a theatrical universe and these characters are popping up over and over again. So the more I was reading about stuff, the more I went, oh, okay, great. Time to start at the beginning and go through the entire Henry ad. Right. Yeah, if there's anything to learn about Shakespeare from this, it's that Shakespeare can go anywhere. You yeah. can put it in a school, you can put it on a stage, you can put it on a laptop. Yeah. And it's so fun to watch. Yeah, it's like, it's like this, this famous quote, uh, all the world is a stage. And now I think we, we've just, we've gone beyond that because it's... <laughs> and, I've, and I've never done it before, but now I know I don't, he's not very afraid to show gory things like child murder. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's wrong. No, wait till Titus Andronicus. <laughs> yeah. Next week, man, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. he's only dialing up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I find amazing uh, is that Game of um, Thrones compared to Shakespeare is just is, is nothing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Game of Thrones is something, but Shakespeare is, is something. Wait, where do you think they got it from? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. Where he took a lot of devices from. There was the humiliation of Duchess Eleanor uh, yeah. last week, which was very literally just taken. Obviously, uh, feeding someone uh, their children in a pie also <laughs> occurs in Titus and in Game of Thrones. So he definitely took a lot of inspiration yeah. from this. Russell, you had a point. I was, I was just going to say that um, it's amazing that Shakespeare was probably only about 24 years old when he wrote the Henry trilogy. <sighs> And for a, a theatre to commission a 24-year-old to write such an epic um, says a lot about his uh, ability and the, the faith that people had in his ability. Yeah, and the creative chances that theatres used to take on uh, emerging theatre makers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably will be dead by the time they were... Yes, that's true. Yeah, the, the lifespan was seen as uh, a somewhat collapsed accordion there. Uh, I just want to pick up on that world's a stage remark because I don't think it's ever been more literally true than probably right now. Yeah. Because I think this has been yeah. our most global cast ever, yeah. and everyone is live right now simultaneously together all around the world. And I just, amazing. I it never ceases to amaze me. It never ceases to amaze me. Oh, we have our customary post-show doggos. Doggos. Yes. <laughs> This is Baxter. Are they kitty? Oh, it's Emma. 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 Wonderful. Is that a big show? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, I'm sure your dog is probably deeply distressed to find you uh, mourning your son. Oh, there we go. The dogs are plenty now. They're all flooding in. Excellent. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Audience Sarah, do we have, have any more questions from our um, audience? Yes, we do. So there's one here that I have to ask, um, which is um, from uh, Asa, I hope I'm saying your name right, um, who is four years old uh, and says, good job, guys. Are you all OK? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, knowing that a four year old should watch me do that, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're um, all OK. I'm fine. I don't think you could go great for me after this. <laughs> <laughs> And I was four yeah. hours watching Teletubbies, so. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, but, thank yeah. you so much for asking. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah. neighbour, um, like, across the street, she's, like, seven. She wanted to watch it, so, like, she was watching it. And she thought I died, and she was getting really upset. <laughs> Look out the window, she's like, <gasps> and I was like Good yeah. acting, though. Wow. Yeah, we might we might need to ask acting. all. All right, so here's one. So I'm assuming that the audience that are sticking around right now are regulars. Uh, and if that's the case, here's a challenge for you. You've just inspired me there, Scarlett. I think this could be a great idea. Uh, have you ever seen Gogglebox? Have you ever yeah. seen people watching? 
<laughs> the show. Yeah. If you guys want to film yourselves watching the show and share your reactions with us on Twitter using the hashtag show must go online, we would love to see them. Similarly, yeah. I just wanted to pick up on something we said from earlier about our, our studios, like our inside the actor studio kind of vibe where we've got all our setup. If you guys want to take photos of that and share them uh, using the hashtag show must go online, I'm sure our audience will be fascinated to see the massive array of props. I mean, what was so seamless about that final scene was the fact that we had this baby getting passed around. Yeah. That meant there were like five babies in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many babies. Amazing. So good. Sarah, any um, more questions? Yes. Um, so let me go through my questions here. Um, oh, so there was one which was, um, how did the actors find communication um, between e each other uh, during rehearsals? Obviously not, not being able to be in the same room. Yeah, I, I think rehearsal. Yeah, I think it was works. it's good Great. because I thought it would be really delayed because of the connection stuff and being on this, but it actually wasn't because I know that Ruth, I when I was doing it with you, you said like you were gonna come in like a few words before my line, and I think that worked well, mm -hmm. and we did it like that. So yeah. Also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, everybody was so. very open, and so. I'm really appreciated that everybody was the while we were rehearsing is very open and so that it's yeah. very good and thank you so much Rob and Sarah yeah. uh, for yeah. this and for <laughs> all of the so casts great. here yeah thank and, you I mean, oh. we kind of rehearse exactly how you've seen the show mm -hmm. is in another kind of zoom setting um so we practice the timing and the passing through the over the screen and around the screen um and yeah. we kind of just were staying in contact over the last two and a half days, mm. three days maximum, yeah. um, trying to fit in with the different time differences. So it was really a collaborative effort. And I was the fight manager. Right up there. It was also a, um, an, we had like rehearsal rooms, but Rob would come, would do one-to-ones with us. So basically Rob and Sarah were pretty much locked in there yeah. for like three days. Yeah. <laughs> <Almost> <laughs> We are one with so Zoom now. Interesting them because it's like of rehearsing with somebody. There's um there's a chat window, and anybody can launch in and, and talk. So you can be rehearsing with one person, and then somebody else will be messaging, going, "Oh, this is going really well," or just something really nice and supportive. So it's been a really supportive mm. process, albeit very short. It's really interesting because it's like even though we are on Zoom, it has. It hasn't felt like that. It's felt like we've all been in a room, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is really mind boggling. Cause I feel like I know you all, but I've only known you for four days. I know. <laughs> but that's, that's true. Um, it's the same finding of moments and um, connection, even though we weren't right there. It was, it was really lovely, especially the small um, rehearsals where we could expand into a bigger scene. I just really enjoyed the process. Such amazing camaraderie with everyone, and yeah, everyone. Thanks so much for being so open, so willing to just do scenes as and when. It's been fantastic considering we're all on different time zones, and uh, yeah, there there is a genuine sense of you're like I know you all really well, <laughs> even though I've never been in the same room with any of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those crazy things, isn't it? The um... oh, sorry, Hector, go on. I really, I really want to perform this live on stage with all you guys now. <laughs> I think there's probably plenty of talent it. agents who will have noticed your performance. <laughs> yes, absolutely. They yeah. should do. <laughs> they absolutely should do. Uh, yeah, amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. I had a, I had a thought to chip in, but it's gone out of my head, so never mind. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the sense of... It's been a long four days. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Sorry, no, I was. Actually, it's a nice thing. It's a nice thing just to all of you uh, that, uh, you know, the, we are continually amazed every single week when we put together um, a cast of people... Uh, probably 90% of whom uh, we haven't met before or haven't worked before with before. Uh, and it is consistently incredible, the quality of performance that you're able to turn around in such a small amount of time and the way that you all rally together to support each other um, to get the best out of every minute of rehearsal, of which there aren't many. <laughs> uh, and, it, it, you know, this format would not work without your guys' extraordinary commitment to each other. So thank you for that ensemble, genuine ensemble vibe. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, Rob. I think we should be thanking the coronavirus because if it wasn't for the coronavirus, we wouldn't have done it. So. <laughs> Very true. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's Silver true. linings. Yeah. Making. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> talk about with this, you know, um, uh, sort of necessity being the mother of invention, and and it's that idea that through this these constraints that have been forced upon us, suddenly we've been able to 
have this beautiful situation of working with all of you amazing people um, and building this community and it's just wonderful and it's a, like Rob said you've all got stuck in to this very strange new world <laughs> and embraced it and just pulled off amazing performances like that and it's just amazing. <laughs> So good, so good. Uh, I just want to point out, uh, as uh, one of our uh, groundlings has just mentioned, please do uh, like the video if you enjoyed the show. Please do subscribe to the channel. Uh, set a reminder for next week's Titus Andronicus. Uh, do mm. consider uh, making a donation to the Patreon if you are able. The Patreon acts as an opt-in hardship fund for everyone that takes part. So anyone that's lost work or is facing financial difficulties as a result of uh, the shutdown of the theatres and all the rest of it uh, can get some small amount of support as a result of their participation in the shows so we really thank you all uh, who are already donating to the patreon and if you have an interest in doing so you can find a link in the description thank you so much and on with the questions <laughs> yes so we were talking a little bit about sort of the, the process and casting and things so we have a sort of two questions that relate so one is how do you choose the actors and also do you cast young people under the age of 18 uh well the answer to the second <laughs> one is yes, yes. definitely uh Hector, how old are you? I'm 10. 10, wonderful. And Scarlett, how old are you? I was you? 10 last month. 12. 12, look at that. So the answer is a, is a definitive yes, where it's called for, and it was definitely called for in this play. Yeah. And I think really those uh, moments of extraordinary violence wouldn't have been anywhere near as powerful or as, as affecting uh, if we hadn't have uh, cast people of the appropriate age for the characters. Um, so thank you both for being so brave uh, in stepping in and, and performing those kind of extreme moments of, of almost the worst of humanity in a way, uh, but doing it in such a way that really connected with our audience and really moved many of them to tears. So thank you for that. Um, so yes, it is the short answer. <laughs> and what was the first question? And the first one was, how do you choose actors? Oh, how do we choose actors? Yes, so uh, Sydney Aldridge, casting director. Uh, shout out to Sydney. She came on board a couple of weeks ago to help us with the casting process. However, the way that our casting works is that you yourself can join us. If you go to the video description and you go to robmiles.co.uk forward slash the show must go online and click the take part button, there is a sign up sheet do that it. you can fill in. Exactly. Do it. Do it. <laughs> uh, and you can take part whether you are an amateur whether you're a trainee whether you're a recent graduate or whether you're an old pro uh, we welcome everybody we want to include as many people as we can and from all around the world as well so english doesn't even need to be your first language though of course confidence in it would probably be an advantage <laughs> uh, but yes uh, we are aiming to be as inclusive as we possibly can be with the casting uh, it's something that we take very seriously here uh, and that inclusivity stretches across not just underrepresented groups in theater but uh, protected groups across the equalities act uh, and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, we try to be as blind in our casting as possible uh, in terms of uh, a number of different variables. Uh, and so, yeah, just please don't, don't ever think that uh, you you are not right to play a certain role, for instance. Uh, if there's something that you really want to play, let us know. And we do consider everybody's preferences as well to the extent that we can. Amazing. Um, cool. So let me have a look at my other ones. So, oh. Um, so there was a question here about the kind of the, the Henry six and three parts. So what was Shakespeare's train of thought when he wrote all three parts and how d has this skill and ideas evolved over that? So it's also a question for those who've seen, um, the three parts, but um, you to... yeah, I, I, I believe he didn't write them in the right order, right? He wrote yes. like the second part first and the first part left. Yes, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, uh, <laughs> so Ema, who was our guest introducer for part one, talked yeah. about the fact that it was a prequel. Uh, and it's the one change that we made to the chronology because yeah. we felt that it would be best for the audience to kind of see these three plays in succession, one after the other, because then it helps you build relationships right. with the characters. It helps you, you know, our Henry has uh, aged by five to ten years at each play. So you've seen his full kind of life, really, uh, as king. Um, and yeah, we, we just kind of wanted to take that approach. So that's the one change that we've made to the chronology. I think the evolution of his writing is a fascinating one because everyone has such different opinions. Uh, Owen, who was on today, said that he thought this one, I think, was his favourite out of the three. Um, our introducer for last week's, um, uh, Charlene, said that that one was her favourite out of the three. Um, the people that we've cast have their own favourites as well. Um, so I, I sometimes wonder whether... 
because we're in this early stage uh, and he's experimenting with a lot of things and he's being as bold as he can as many, in as many different directions as he can, it feels like these are still theatrical experiments. And where last week was this variety show where you had these massive clashes in tone between like comic ensemble uh, kind of lower class uh, scenes and then like hyper intense two people duologues between the most powerful people in the world. Um just struck a very very different shape th- to this week's where it was almost exclusively uh, your kind of upper echelons of society and everyone else had become almost anonymous in the process uh, and uh, it was just about constant backstabbing betrayal chaos anarchy uh, you know it had a very very different flavor and all three of them had very different flavors you know you had Joan of Arc and Talbot in the first one that felt like superheroes and nobody in this feels like a superhero nobody in this feels like anything other than a flawed and honestly quite monstrous individual in various ways and yet Shakespeare because he's Shakespeare makes you feel absolute sympathy for Margaret after all that she's done absolute sympathy for York after all that he's done and it's extraordinary the way that he manages to find the the four dimensions in every character and kind of show them over that span you know Clifford at the end of uh, part two we were like oh my god Clifford's turned into Batman he's a badass <laughs> and then this play starts and you're like oh no no off the deep end so yeah it's you know it is incredible and it's it's testament to him being amazing very waffle awesome. <laughs> love it it (laughs) cool okay so i i have a question for warwick um obviously other people can jump in as well um but in act four scene six um the question is why do you think warwick refuses protectorship until shared with clarence uh and uh, particularly remembering back to humphrey's fate in the, the earlier part yeah, we, we talked about this a bit in rehearsals because, I mean, you could sort of go in, in several directions with it. And um, we sort of decided really that uh, Warwick do, um, Warwick wants power, but to my mind, he's not a power grabber in a showy sense. He's quite happy to be the power behind the throne, a sort of puppet master in a way. And I think all the way through, he's trying to make sure he is safe and that the person who is on his side is top dog. And in that scene, there is a very real possibility of Clarence um, uh, being ending up with uh, with more power than him if he ends up becoming the king. So in order to um, keep him down, uh, Mark Warwick's strategy is, OK, well, he's going to be Lord Protector because if he's Lord Protector, he's not going to be king. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I've actually answered the question there. I feel like <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so by the end of it, he's. Um, wanting, it's more about stopping Clarence from going up. Um, and if that, if it, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Ultimately, obviously sharing power. Okay, great. We're both law protector. So actually I'm okay with that because he's still at the level where I want him and he's not going to rise above that in theory. <laughs> It'll be fascinating to see if there are any disagreements uh, from uh, people that are watching at home because that was the choice that we made as a as a you know as a result of our exploration of the text and other choices are available. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thank you for that, Ali. That was awesome. Um, so uh, da, da, oh, I've done that one already. Um, <laughs> so oh, I have another one uh, about King Henry. Um, so you didn't get this one. So how do you feel about Henry's downward spiral of power and how do you think he copes with it? Um, not very well, uh, <laughs> about as well as can be expected. He, I mean, it takes, we're about two minutes into the first scene and he's made a very unpopular decision, which has lost just about all of his following. Didn't take very long. And I think, I think but, but after a certain point, I think around the time he has his contemplative monologue on the molehill that's overlooking the battle and envying the the simple life wishing he was it was able to live a shepherd's life and feeling that that's more rewarding it's more it's more the life he wish he wishes he could lead um but he, but he can't because of who, the way he, because of um who his father was um i think by that stage i don't think he has any a great deal of affection or or love for the for the for power itself and it's almost um by the time he gets uh, reinstated as king, uh, that's um, <laughs> had to do it. Um, 
Yeah, so, yeah his first act as soon as he gets reinstated is to immediately abdicate all the power. So it's I'll wear the crown. So basically, I'm willingly allowing myself to be a <laughs> more crowns going on. Um, I'll I'll be effectively willingly allowing myself to be considered a puppet king, whilst uh, entrusting all the laws of state to to Warwick and Clarence. So so you do all the work, and I will be king in name alone. <laughs> Uh, I just thank, thank you. Well. you know, it, I think it really answered the question. I also just want to say uh, that uh, Emily is mentioning in the chat that she doesn't want to feel bad by abandoning the screen to go and get more wine. So I just want to give you public permission to do so. Please get me hence and bring it back with you and fetch some for me. Chris is gone. Like my mom. Chris is gone. <laughs> I don't want to seem rude. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, but it's seven o'clock in the morning, so... Uh, oh, yes, yeah. might be a little early. It's always five o'clock somewhere. Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, wonderful. Do we have any final questions from our audience then, Sarah? Um, let me just check. So um, there was a, sort of one of it's a technical one, um, <laughs> which, um, which someone asked earlier, which is how we, how we found using the Zoom-YouTube combo for performance, and did we kind of look into any other formats? Um, so, I mean, I think we, it, it's kind of the first, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, it's, I'll let you take that one, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. So we were already familiar with Zoom. We, we used it quite a lot before um, and we knew that you could do the live streaming. Um, and what we actually really liked about it um, was that it meant we can kind of have, you know, everyone organized uh, on, on Zoom together and we can kind of keep everything running nice and tidy there. But YouTube just... Um, has some really nice functionality. So like the live chat is really good. And the fact then it records it and you can watch it back later um, was brilliant as well. Um, because we know not obviously not everyone can um, join us live um, each week. Uh, so it kind of had the best of both worlds. So yeah, so it's worked really well for, for us. So yeah, we're, we're keeping it. <laughs> <Short answer. laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think that is, um, oh, 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 we have one more from Annabelle. Hello, Annabelle. Oh, hello, you Annabelle. Are awesome. We Bam love your art. We love it. Incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope yes. the scene lived up to your depiction of it. <laughs> yes. Um, so we, uh, she, she asked um, to the whole cast, so histories, comedies, or tragedies? Pick oh, wow. Uh, in, in the state <laughs> we're in right now, comedies. <laughs> Yeah, always comedy. It's not a comedy. Always comedy. <laughs> 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 Problem plays. Problem plays. It's funny. Problem plays. Romances. <laughs> tragedy, but if you can find a bit of the comedy in it. Yeah. You know, I don't think always a tragedy is complete tragedy. I think there's always a little bit of humor hidden in there that if you can find I like it. Yeah. To I actually. The porter in my bed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. What was that, Hector? I like some of the sarcastic lines. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ironic. Yes, ironic lines. I like yes, doing comedy like jokes. This one particularly funny, yeah. but there we are. So I'm looking forward to Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're all looking forward to Midsummer Night's Dream and in this platform as well. I can, yeah. I can only imagine what's going to happen by the time we get to it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> on a school trip I went to watch a Midsummer Night's Dream and I'd never done like I'd never seen any Shakespeare or any, anything before that it was a few months ago I think and I was so surprised because I thought it was going to be really boring and like mm, mm, but it was actually really fun you weren't at the Globe yeah it was at the Globe Theatre we went on a school trip and it was really really colourful but I thought it was just going to be like uh... <laughs> absolutely props to yeah. the Globe, the globe and yes. see something there yeah, but that's the thing. I, I, I was actually going to go to the Globe in June to um, see something there because I've never been to the Globe before. But uh, of course, the virus hit, and so mm. fortunately, I haven't paid any money to do that. Mm. Yet, so <laughs> yeah, that's a relief. Oh, I have to. Yeah, my favourite thing in Midsummer Night's Dream is that at the end they're doing a play, and it's meant to be a really mm. rubbish play. So that'll yeah. be interesting. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, any more questions, Sarah, or are we all wrapped up? Uh, let me just check. Sure thing. Um, just mention the fact before the the next question, the the fact that I had to do some method acting during the during the thing because 
uh, I had some mud on my fingers and some ketchup and I needed to remove it before the next scene. So I ended up like just eating my fingers like <laughs> and eating mud, forgetting that I had mud on my fingers. <laughs> I did that one pile of mud. So that was my, my <laughs> memory for that. I ate some mud. Extra vitamins are fine. Sacrifice for your oh. art, absolutely. Sacrifice for the art, Come absolutely. It it's really hard to scroll when you've got jam all over your fingers. Exactly, because yeah. you're thinking, you're thinking, yeah, I, I need was... to scroll down, I need to scroll down, so what, what else can I do apart from eating my ketchup? I, uh, <laughs> I was having to like clean my laptop between the scenes I wasn't mm. on, because it was <laughs> getting stickier and stickier. So these, these are the things to think about next time. Just yeah. bring a, a, a bucket of water and just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did anyone call out Ramona yet on accidentally stabbing her computer during rehearsals? Yes. Up yet? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you've been out of passion. Oh, no. oh, God. Wonderful. One more question and then we'll call it a night. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So um, Anna has just sent another good one. So we'll make this our last one. Um sure how do you think Shakespeare made the decision to go from a history to writing Titus Andronicus? Oh. Yeah, really good question. Really yeah. good question. It's an interesting start, isn't it, with the two comedies? It's a really interesting start. I, I, I almost feel like it might be something to do with how bleak this play is. If it was well received, he just decided to yeah. really lean into that darkness. Um, I mean, to me, I do feel like Titus is a black comedy. It's the blackest of black comedies, but I do feel like it is a play that has the capacity to be very, very darkly funny. And I think that's a tone that we don't find often in Shakespeare's works elsewhere. Um, so it's definitely another one of his very bold theatrical experiments. Um, it does feel, th this to me feels like the bloodiest play that we've produced so far. Yeah. So it is interesting that he decided to kind of double down in that direction. <laughs> I think he must have had a really positive response from people. Yeah. And they really enjoyed yeah. the blood. We really like the violence. Yeah. And thought, I'm going to go... Give them, more, give them what they want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got to think about what a savage time it was that he was writing in, in terms of uh, what was deemed acceptable mm. entertainment. In that just down the road from the Globe, you would have had a bear baiting mm. ring where they would have just had animal fights happening yeah. over time. Uh, and, you know, uh, the I Romans, mean, you know, where the play is based, ha obviously had blood sport where they had slaves fighting each other and things like that. So, uh, you know, we... we I guess our closest example now will be UFC, maybe. Um, but uh, even that is fairly sanitised compared to uh, the kind of stuff that was going on when he was writing. And so I think the brutality, uh, the proximity of death to people in Shakespeare's time as well is probably something that we are not used to. Shakespeare himself lost a child um, and, uh, you know, people kind of look for echoes of that in the plays um, after it happened. Obviously, his son's name was Hamnet and Hamlet. Uh, some people would draw that connection. Uh, but death was a lot more present in Elizabethan times. You know, obviously he faced a similar shutdown like the one that we are facing, um, but without the, I guess, the modern infrastructures that kind of shield us from the reality of it in a way, um, where in his time it would have been there, you know, in the street as you were walking down the street. People so... died so, you could die so easily. You break your leg, you would die. Yeah. You yeah. know, a bad tooth, you would yeah. die. <laughs> yeah and it's not even great injuries it's just everyday yeah. stuff that we take paracetamol for and his actors fought in duels there are records of mm. them fighting in duels so they were expert fencers and they had to be because people might jump up on the stage and join in in some of these mass battles <laughs> so they had to be able to defend themselves um you know P christopher marlowe obviously uh, died uh, being stabbed over apparently a dispute over a bill uh, it depends who who you believe but that's the story for another time uh, yeah yeah so uh, hopefully that's gone some way towards answering your question. Uh, yeah, death, gore, brutality, clearly very popular from this one and uh, just decided to kind of go all the way. <laughs> and just uh, in the chat, it said that um, I think Emily put that um, they might have just had too much blood left over from Henry. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, you buy, you buy your body parts in bulk. So you've got to make, <laughs> got to make the most of them. 
before they go <laughs> off. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And thank you for sticking around till the bitter end, if you have done, to enjoy uh, our post-show discussion. Thank you to our actors uh, for your wonderfully insightful comments. And uh, we will see you next week for the very bloody, bold and resolute Titus Andronicus. Thank All you so right. much, everyone. Like, subscribe, Patreon, and sign up to take part. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.